Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 12 years on active duty, uh, the majority or pretty much all of which as a Navy SEAL. Three deployments, two of which uh, were combat deployments to Afghanistan, which we'll absolutely get into. Uh, he's an active law enforcement officer in Orange County, California, and he uses donut glaze for deodorant. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Travis Kennedy. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, I know. Honored to be here. Yeah, shit, it's it's uh, it's an honor to have you, man. Um, I've caught bits and pieces of uh, the show that you did with Sean. Anytime, uh, if there's a prospective guest that uh, I either want to interview or know that I might, I try not to to listen to very much of it, just to to not either recreate or uh, know things before I ask them. But mm -hmm. uh, but you know, just a super interesting um, career and story, and and uh, you know, I just I can't wait to to dive into some of the stuff that you know you've done, not just militarily, but of course what you're doing now as a as a law enforcement officer and. Uh, especially with the, the things that go on in, in today's society. I'd love to get your perspective on. So thanks for absolutely. Thanks for uh, when was the last time you legit ate a donut in your cop uniform? <laughs> uh, I worked Saturday and I had one then this no past shit. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so not that long ago. Usually late at night, me and my partners <laughs> go like, if we're just craving something, we'll go like three, four o'clock in the morning. No shit. Like actual donuts, huh? <laughs> actual donuts. <laughs> I embraced it fully. Yeah, that's awesome. What's the uh, what's the fastest you've driven in your cop car? Probably well over 100. I mean, do you, do you know like exactly how fast or like in, in the tens, like 140, 160? No, no, probably like 100, 110. Really? So you, I, I can only assume you've driven faster in your personal car than you have in a cop car, right? No, I, I I would probably <laughs> drove faster in my police car than no my shit. personal car, not, especially in the city streets. Yeah, not a speed demon, huh? <laughs> I guess fucking California, you almost can't speed with how many people are there, huh? Yeah, I mean, two, three o'clock in the morning, you can get away with it because yeah. no one's on the road. Yeah, so but no like high speed chases where you're doing fucking crazy, crazy numbers. Huh? Not yet. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Nothing surpassing a hundred. Yeah. Huh. Um, we might have to change that today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's, uh, what's the favorite time, your favorite time that you've almost died? My favorite time, uh, I'd probably say overseas, um, on second deployment, we would get this nightly attacks, but this one night in particular, they get, they're getting lucky and send an IDF, you know, into our, into our little fob and. It yeah. came really close. One hit our kitchen. Oh shit! Uh, that was made of dirt and pretty much decimated it. Wow. <laughs> and we were pretty close. I mean, it was a guy actually got hit. He ended up being okay, but yeah, that was probably the scariest time. Did uh, what, was it a, any serious injuries? Or no, ser no, nothing too serious. He got some frag to his back, yeah. but he was uh, back you? right at it though. Did they have any like uh, anti artillery units uh, that you were ever with that that ever uh, fucked those guys up, or or did they usually get away with it? They would get away with it, but we all we had our uh, own internal like one twenties uh, mortar systems and on our little yeah that we would utilize like daily. Oh shit! Sure. So we I've been occasionally they would we would have like a unit far away send like the one five fives like the howitzers yeah. Over us, but that was very rare. No oh, shit. Yeah. Wow. So you, I mean, you, in most of the uh, experiences over there, you were hanging it out pretty, pretty yeah. rural. I would say the second one more than the first, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that. Uh, pumpkin spice or chai latte? Pumpkin spice. Amen. All day. How about, how about that? <laughs> so if I can... Pumpkin spice. Let me. Uh, there you go. Zoom in on that at all. Pumpkin spice fucking uh, deodorant <laughs> that I have on my desk here, which is... Uh, that's an inside joke. I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. 
And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just an all-around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re-revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American-made, uh, all American-sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house, and they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now, and I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd also like to talk about uh, my brand of dog food that just came out. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work Work, help you become your dog's hero. Uh, what what is your morning routine? And, and this is uh, I'd say on on most normal days uh, when when you actually go to work. So when I go to work, so I'm night shift, so I'll, I'll wake up around one one thirty p.m. Get up, um, probably drink a lot of water, and I immediately eat. Uh, I'm like a big I eat the same thing every day. I eat like three eggs, two pieces of toast. I pretty much never deviate from that. I don't know why. I'm just like a stickler with breakfast. But uh, just with breakfast? Yeah, every just with breakfast. Yeah. Every other meal, I could, I'll wing it, but I have to eat like first thing in the morning. Yeah. Uh, I don't like, I don't fast. I don't do anything like that. Um, after I eat, I'll typically drink my coffee and then I'll go kind of answer emails or whatever, do some business stuff outside of the law enforcement and then i'll go into work around four o'clock and i'll work out yeah right about an hour before i actually go to work do you find that uh or i, I guess do you structure your workouts to not be too fucking nuts in case you have to get into it on there because i mean i know for me at least on active duty I, you know that was always a fucking concern of of yeah. uh you know blowing your fucking wad in the gym and then you go to work and if you have to go hands-on with somebody yeah. or you know whatever do you keep absolutely that yeah. that's always in the back of my mind i don't want to get too fatigued or too smoked yeah that because i know something's gonna go down especially the city i work in there's being i'm new so I, I but i know it's always around the corner like a blink of an eye something can happen i don't want to be too smoked before i even start yeah. you just tell the guy be like dude it was leg day Can yeah you <laughs> uh, in terms of your days off do you try to stay on that same same schedule and uh, I don't stay on night shift my days off. Really? I don't stay up. I mean, the first night back like on my Sunday or something, I'll stay up late. But that Monday morning, I'll wake I'll sleep throughout the night and I'll wake up around nine, yeah. nine thirty. I bounce back pretty quickly. I don't like to just every day of the week do stay up at night. That messes me up. Yeah. So you do what three three days or three work shifts, night work shifts, and then four days of normal shit and then you flip flop it yeah so three days a week i work about four days off yeah yep. shit that's not bad uh i, I would uh that fucking night night day flip flop would drive me nuts though is is uh your goal to get on days or do you want to stay on nights yeah goal is to actually stay where i'm at uh working the days i mean yeah it, it is kind of a normal schedule in the sense of sleep but as far as police work goes yeah. uh I think me personally, as my personality, I'm more of a night shift copper than a day. Yeah. That only reason is because one daytime, everyone's out. Everyone expects more. A lot more people on this on the road, which I don't like. Yeah. I rather I hate traffic. So, and at night you're dealing with a different type of clientele. You're dealing with the crooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know the day shift. You know you handle, uh, you know like just basic. Uh, regular people, you know, everyday calls. Soccer moms not yeah. coming to a complete stop. Yep. Yeah. The uh, ha have you seen a a fair bit of shit go down in the short amount of time? How, how long have you been uh, been doing it? Well, I just got sworn this past uh, this March of this year. Oh no shit! So I haven't even been a cop a full year yet, uh, not on my own at least. And yes, I have. I've seen a lot. Yeah. I live. I work in a city. It's it's inner city. Yeah. Um, 
so a lot of there's always something going down in, in my city yeah. um in the short amount of time i've been there i've seen a lot so i'm yeah. um, i'm grateful for it because it, it gives me experience to be that much you know better um and handle things that other cops may not even see or may only see once in like a three or four year span and i see like once a week yeah wow uh, well yeah we'll definitely get into that shit. Mm-hmm. um all right, so just kind of, I guess, backtracking or starting from scratch, uh, in terms of where you grew up, uh, where where are you from originally? Originally, I grew up in Huntington Beach, California. So Pretty much my whole childhood, I grew up there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, how old are you? I'm 33. Uh, I can only imagine a whole, a whole lot has changed from when you grew up to how it is now. Yeah, it's definitely uh, grown, and I still like it, but it's definitely... Got more uh, crowded and convoluted with uh, just more people, and yeah. and the sentiment in California too is kind of different. Different, yeah. yeah. Uh, to me, it's uh, you know I I'm not from California, uh, but we went there a couple times growing up, and it, it I know you remember shit as a kid a little different, but you being from there, uh, it, it seems to me like even in the 12 years that I have not lived there anymore. It seems like it's gone downhill, like in terms of the upkeep. Like it seems like much more of a shithole in a lot of places. Yeah, I would say certain places, definitely like Los Angeles and even San Diego, um, it's yeah. going downhill. Really? I mean, like even downtown and shit, or downtown? Yeah, downtown. Homeless is out of control. LA is a whole. I don't even. LA is like a, just a whole another world in yeah. Southern California. I mean, I haven't even been to LA and few years oh because wow. uh, I, I, I do not want to even step foot in that city yeah. um, personally where I live now is Southern California it's a little more you know conservative um, it's it's a nicer area I would I would say um, and they keep it decent in the so but the rest of it I just yeah it's just a large those large cities that, that I feel like just kind of yeah do you go back to, to where you grew up much yeah, I try to. I mean, I'll go and hang out there, but that's about it. Like, we'll go out to eat or something like that. It's not far from where I live. Oh, I got you. Now. Your parents are still there? Uh, no, my parents, they still live in Southern California, but they live in, like, the out, outer uh, beach towns, like a different beach town now. Uh, and what was that like growing up uh, growing up there and, and uh, you know, siblings or just your, your childhood as it relates to relationship with parents, uh, other kids, school, et cetera? I would say I had a really, I had a good childhood. Um, I spent time between my mom and dad. They were divorced, but that being said, it was it was good to go. I mean, we shared time. Um, my father, I pretty much spent the majority of the time with my dad. I would say growing up as a as a child throughout middle school, high school, but it was good. Played sports. Um, enjo- really enjoyed growing up in that town. And it kind of it paid dividends. I had everything at my disposal, especially when I wanted to become a SEAL because I was right there by the beach and yeah. I had everything I needed to set myself up. Yeah. Did you have uh, brothers and sisters? I, had a, I have a sister. She's 30. Oh, okay. Younger. What uh, What does she do? Uh, she works with my dad. Um, she actually helps, works for me too, in my oh, business. Sure. But uh, yeah, she lives in uh, Wyoming now. Oh, okay. Uh, um, what, uh, in terms of the career path that your parents took what was that like their career paths yeah uh it was good my dad's a professional wedding photographer he owns his own business oh really so he started out he's done that his whole life i mean he he started out taking pictures of like kids on ponies and then developed from there now he owns a large wedding photographer business in orange county where he lives now um my mom she did like a, a kind of different jobs but she main career was property management for like big complexes and stuff like that uh but now she lives she takes care of my grandmother her mom yeah uh relationship with your parents uh still still good still solid yeah Yeah, still solid see them all the time do uh do your mom and dad get along yeah they do they've always believe it or not they've actually gotten along as far as i can remember so (laughs) (laughs) which is not many people can say that but yeah my dad's like just really laid back and cordial, so he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, he never doesn't ruffle any feathers. No, yeah, 
Uh, it seems like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree that yeah. way. Huh? <laughs> they seem pretty even keeled and laid back. Um, so what was the, was it sports? Was it a combination of things? What was the kind of the light switch or the motivation for you to, to join the military and why SEAL teams? Uh, I felt like I was always into like my childhood, into the military, into law enforcement, dress up as, as a child. And I always had that kind of innate attraction to it. Um, when I was really young, I wasn't really certain, like, I, w I wanted to do military. I didn't really know, no, until I was probably a freshman in high school. Uh, but when I got into high school, then I became serious about my career. I've always dabbled in sports, baseball, did wrestling. My main sport of choice I really enjoyed was lacrosse, played that throughout high school. But so that only that helped me, but it wasn't the kind of the driving factor for joining the military. And then when I wanted to join, I actually doubt I thought about doing a plethora of things like thought about going to the Naval Academy and being a pilot. I knew I wanted to do something more than just enlist and just be kind of like a grunt or infantry or something like that. Nothing, nothing to say that's bad about those careers, but I felt like I could do more. Yeah. And then when I was exposed to the SEAL teams, uh, that's when my interest just like peaked. Yeah. Do you remember uh, your first intro to them? It was actually, yeah, my dad's actually the one who kind of introduced me to him because um, he knew I was interested. So he, he was, I was interested in the Navy mostly because I liked the water aspect of the military. But he brought home, like, it was like a pamphlet. Just back in the day, they would just have these little trifold pamphlets. And hand that to me. He's like, this might be a good fit for you. <laughs> no shit. <That's laughs> so trip, man. Like as soon as I saw that, Got verification, you know, I was like, this, yeah, that's me all day. Yeah. So it wasn't uh, the movie Navy SEALs. Or fucking <laughs> anything like that. But as soon as I got that, then I started doing more research yeah. and I found out all about those yeah. documentaries and yeah. okay. it wasn't G.I. Jane or anything like that. <laughs> <you know. laughs> that, that actually came out when I was, uh, when I was going through BUDS and uh, a, a big group of us, I think we were in first phase, uh, all went to the theater and fucking yeah. kind of crashed. It was an entertaining movie, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so, all right. So you go through, you play lacrosse, lacrosse, you're going through high school. Uh, did you join right after high school? Yeah, I joined actually while I was in, um, like the delayed entry program the summer going into my senior year. Oh yeah. So joined that. And from there, then I kind of just prepped as much as I can for a good solid year, year and a half, year and some change. Yeah. And then when I graduated in like June and I left the following month. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty similar path uh, for both of us. The, uh, at, when you went through, was there, um, the dive fair program and all that where like, did you have the, the SO contract or? No, I didn't have an SO contract. Uh, when I joined, you still had to pick a rate, um, with kind of the guarantee to try out okay so and you that, did core school yeah i picked corman it was just like probably eight or nine jobs like here this is what you could pick if you want to become a seal yeah. like correlate and i just kind of whatever went down the list and i was like oh medicine sounds interesting <laughs> all the other ones i had no idea what the hell they were i was 18 i was like i just picked one that th i thought it was interesting and i thought it'd probably pay dividends down the road yeah the uh the core school experience, uh, what was that like? Wow, that was interesting. It was like after boot camp, I just went right across the street to core school. And it was, it's hard for me to remember. It was like between eight and ten weeks, but it was self-paced. Really? Meaning <laughs> you basically sit on a computer and study material, and when you were ready to take a test, you signed up and took a test. Jeez. There was like no no instruction no like instructors teaching you things and then if you you had to hit like a couple uh real world labs that you would just sign up for like hey do an iv and do an assessment and it's kind of just self-paced so you could finish it as fast as like eight weeks or ten weeks it was How strange should you finish it i think i took like the longest time <laughs> <That's> I, <don't laughs> 11 weeks. I barely made it yeah i barely made it yeah um uh, to me, that seems fucking crazy. That uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I don't know if it's still that way or what. But I mean, at, at the end of it, did you feel like you fucking learned anything? Or not was, really? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't. To be honest with you, I just wanted to get through that thing. I didn't even yeah. give a shit about it. Yeah. Uh, 
So I just wanted to pass because at the time I was we were going through like their dive motivator program yeah. with all the guys in core school and other rates that were there that wanted to become SEALs. So that was kind of my front sight focus on that. Man, that's crazy. I mean, it was weird. Was it was such a weird experience to do self paced. Yeah, I mean, because the kids that uh, that are actually going to the fleet to be corpsmen, like you show up knowing fuck all, you know. No, I mean, they don't they don't learn until they actually get to their job and they get you know the OJT and then. Yeah wild uh all right so you go from core school straight to buds yep yeah. core school straight to buds uh did you make it through the first time what class were you no in? i started with 266 and then i got rolled in second phase and i finished with 267 okay i i don't remember the last class that uh that i was there for but it was it was around then i don't i don't remember seeing you probably don't remember seeing me the last few months i was there i like most guys was <laughs> you know Doing the fucking Dude, bear. Checking bear out, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, just focused on getting out and, you know, doing terminal leave and all that. But um, you started with 266, 267. What, uh, what happened? So I got rolled in second phase for the four-mile time run. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that was my biggest, I don't know, lesson learned for yeah. sure. When I was that young, I was, I don't know why. I Looking back, I wish I would have ran more. In so my it wasn't training, like you had shin splints and fucking stress fractures, you just yeah, you know, like po I don't know, I just probably felt post hell week going into second phase. Um, I passed pool comp, and so I got it past pool comp, and I f ended up failing the run like after that, uh, barely. But it was a momentary lap of weakness for me, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I but it's lesson learned. I had a, it was like a big failure for me, yeah. but. And I wasn't in rollback land for very long, probably like a month or two, but it was just enough time I needed to like rest. I don't think I was healed up or something, whatever reason it was. I'd say it's weakness. I say I had fucking didn't pass. It was on me. Yeah. So I mean, similar shit with me. I, I got rolled right before uh, the island uh, with 214. Uh, I, I pinched my sciatic nerve during land nav. Um, in third phase and then failed everything after mm -hmm. that. You know, I just, I couldn't fucking do anything really. And swimming, ironically, I, I was a swimmer all growing up was the, was the first thing that I failed three of. So that's mm -hmm. what I got rolled for. But luckily back then, <clears throat> um, I, I'm actually really fortunate that, that they ran shit the way that they ran it back then, as opposed to when I was an instructor there, because it was very structured and, you know, we still worked the, the kids out, you know, pretty significantly. When I was there, it was like there was one dude in charge, and he I don't think he could have given less of a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, we showed up. He just made sure everybody was there first yeah. thing in the morning, and that was it. You know? Yeah. It was, and it was just like, yeah, okay, fucking semen schmuckatelli, you, you take the guys over <laughs> here and do, like, he just didn't fucking care. And so for, like, eight weeks, I didn't do shit. Like, all I did was eat and yeah. sleep, and, and I recovered. And, and when I came back from that kind of break, Dude, I crushed everything. Yeah. You know, I had like PRs in, in every fucking category. Swims, O course, runs, everything was just was way faster than before. And and you know, I really do think that if I had if I had had to work out hard through that time, I don't know that I would have healed up enough to fucking graduate, honestly. But absolutely, that's funny you say that because that's that's how I personally f feel too. Because yeah. I that month two month break, I think it was like a month and a half, two months. That was just enough time for me to. Yeah. I came back like I came back. I crushed every run after that. Yeah. I got faster. Um, I just felt overall just better. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's fucking wild. Yeah, the overtraining there is uh, is brutal. Um, all right, so you go, you graduate with two six seven, uh, and where did you go first after that? So graduate went to the what team? Yeah. So I went to Silton uh, eighteen Delta, but I did the short course. Because I was a corpsman. Yeah. So after SQT, they're like, hey, we need some guys to go to the, the medic course. And Kennedy, you're one of them. He's the only <laughs> corpsman in the class. <laughs> I had no idea what the hell it was. Yeah. I was. They were just like, you're going. I was like, okay, I'm a new guy. And there no one actually, wanted to go. Yeah. You just want to go to your team. What yeah. Year, what year was this? Like uh, 08? 08. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you just want to go to a team. Yeah, I, I wanted to go to the team. So I was like, and all my peers were like, Peace out. We're going to the team. <laughs> <laughs> so I was behind my team, probably like my peers, about eight months. Yeah. Because I ended up going there. I did Sockham. So 
Special Operations Combat Medic course, which is half of the 18 Delta course, yeah. um, which is in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I mean, there you learn quite a bit, though, right? Oh, yeah. Looking back, I love that school. Yeah. I had so much fun. I learned so, so damn much. And it paid dividends in the teams. Yeah. So. Did you uh, ever have to use shit for real on de on deployments, patching guys up? On partner force and like local nationals, yeah. um, serious injuries. I I didn't have to treat any um, Americans like, yeah, like severely. No, I did some, yeah, nothing on the battlefield. I did like a little stint in uh, Kabul, like the ho the hospital there. Mm -hmm. So I got to work in like their surgery and, and treat some guys coming in off like serious blast wounds and stuff like that. Did for training purposes. Yeah. But uh, nothing like on ops. We never suffer any severe casualties. Oh, fuck, that's good. Um, what, was there a funniest or coolest thing about uh, being at the 18 Delta Medic course? The funniest thing was guys dreading to get uh, catheters put in by other <laughs> students. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was probably the funniest. Or checking uh, your prostate because they made us check each other's prostate. Oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> in the classroom, lined up, take off your, your fucking pants, and with your partner, check. I remember I was teamed up with some SWIT guy, and I was like, oh, dear Lord. Did anybody come? Yeah. <laughs> no, you just weren't doing it right, I guess. Nope, they weren't doing it. Yeah. The uh, the catheter thing, uh, to me, seems, uh, I mean, that's just fucking torturous. I mean, the prostate thing is uncomfortable, but, dude, having a tube shoved up your yeah. fucking cock, like, that's the... That's I, that didn't happen that. to me. I was like, fuck that. I think they only did it for like a few dudes. Yeah. And then after my class, they stopped because everyone started getting like UTIs. Yeah, I don't doubt I mean, because, I mean, yeah, it's a sterile procedure. Yeah. And we're out, in the, they're doing it like in the field, you know. Dude, fuck Supposed that. to do it like on a TCCC, like in the field, try to keep it sanitary. And it's like not Fucking happening. Sand all over. Yeah. It. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Just put some sand on it. Be good. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Christ. Uh all right, so then, uh, so you finished that, and then you go to you said SEAL Team Five. That went four, four. So East Coast guy. All right, so what uh, what was that like checking in and, and I put in for West Coast, and I was like, <laughs> I did. I was like, I want West Coast. Cause I'm from California, <laughs> but they're like, nope, you're going to East Coast. Yeah. Which at first I was kind of disgruntled, but now I wouldn't take it back for anything. Yeah. When you showed up, were there guys that you graduated with that are, had already fucking done anything or? Like, yeah, there was a, a few guys that showed up to um, some of the teams that met met their team on deployment. Oh, wow. Because I, I showed up to Team 4 when the team was already at on deployment. Yeah. Some guys were in Iraq, um, <clears throat> and I showed up kind of towards the tail end. So pe dudes were just showing up, getting off deployment. Oh, wow. Um, so when you checked in, did you jump right into a platoon and a workup? Yep. Yeah. Jump right in. Kind of do the new guy thing when I first got there, just like cleaning up the command and repainting and yeah. shit like that. Sweeping the beach. Yep, fucking. And then they, right, pretty much right away, they, they started sending us to schools. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, which ones did you get? My first deployment, I did nothing but driving schools <laughs> no as shit. a new guy. Really? What All driving. We did like Bedar, Tim O'Neill, um, Bondurant. What uh, can you quick just because I'm a huge car guy and uh, if you want to sit in we do, on the other side of the studio as you can see we do a, a car show yeah <laughs> so I think it'd be cool to get a cop cop on the fucking car show with the shit that we talk about if you have time but absolutely but the uh, uh, in terms of, of each of those schools can you give a kind of a just a synopsis on uh, on what you worked on so the BDR school is like the Humvees like kind of military um, platforms learn how to drive those efficiently learn how to work on them you know, the troubleshoot them and stuff like that. Team O'Neill, which I thought was the funnest driving school I went to, was a rally racing school, pretty yeah. much is in New Hampshire. And we drove like 95 Audis, we drove Subarus, um, Beamers, like old 90 Beamers. So we had the full gamut of all wheel, rear, rear wheel um, drive uh, platforms and they're, they're the blast. My favorite one was the, the Audis, the yeah. all wheel. Yeah, they just shredded the, the course. <laughs> was it like track stuff or? Yeah, uh, it was yeah. all slalom, like dirt track. Wow, you're doing everything That's like fun. full race rally track. Yeah, yeah, what a fucking sweet gig. I didn't get to do any of that shit. My S, my um, chief at the time, SEA, the senior enlisted guy, was all about 
sending new guys yeah. to driving. He's like, because all the new, you're he's like, new, new, new guys, you're driving every, anyway, so <laughs> you're driving all the platform, we go to mobility, yeah. you know, the old guys ain't driving, they yeah. don't want to drive. <laughs> I love that shit. Um, were, so it was those two courses, was it just those two, or did you do another one? I went to, yeah, they went to like ASO level two, um, which is advanced special operations, basically just like Intel school. Um, did like a, a couple other medical courses at Bragg um, with Rangers and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty much it. I, I, I didn't get many schools as a new guy. Yeah, um, Definitely no like skill, especially. I didn't go to Breacher because I was a medic already. Yeah. So, so that was my main. Or yeah, or that was like my main thing to do as a new guy. Yeah, that's fucking good. Um, all right, so how long was your workup before you uh, deployed? A full year, About a year and a half, yeah. Uh, how many other new guys were in your platoon, do you remember? It was like six of us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so on your first deployment, can you walk us through what, what that was like after you know several years of training and the build up, and then you finally fucking boots on the ground, what that was like going to Afghanistan? I, I was... So I was fortunate enough to be in one troop at SEAL Team 4, which their AO at the time was Iraq. And the majority of the old guys were all fucking been there, done that with the Iraq piece. Uh, so I was kind of under a big shadow with the older dudes and looked up to them. So we, I kind of already knew we were going to go to the Middle East at the time. Um, so the expectation was high, especially throughout workup and um, – all, all the training um, things we went to. So it was big, big, big uh, responsibility. And then we ended up going, lifting and shifting, because at the time that Afghanistan popped off. And they're like, hey, we're sending people to Afghanistan now. So about four or five of us get sh lifted and shifted to a two troop in SEAL Team 4 where, we, where I went to Afghanistan <laughs> with them. Um, so I got farmed out to another one because they needed a medic at the time, myself and like three other older guys another sniper and another really senior medic uh, like shooter went with attached to two troop and we went and going to Afghanistan and we relieved team three and, and fob lanes kind of in the Southeast portion of Afghanistan. Um, it was called fob lane in the Argonom Valley. Uh, but it was actually landing there it was kind of a surreal experience especially when not when we got to calf and we flew in like the major hub it was whatever that place was like going to little creek or something it was <laughs> huge it was just like going to a regular military base it wasn't until we actually showed up to the fob and where we saw like fucking team three dudes there all salty and been there and been getting after it where it kind of became real yeah what uh in terms of the time of year and weather what was it like where you were at we got there like September of 010. Yeah. So end of the summer, and then we're there throughout the winter. And then we kind of, you know, spring time frame, we got, we left. Yeah. So was it uh, high elevation, shitty cold weather, not, not an active fighting season in the, in the winter? Yeah. I kind of ebbed in. When we first got there, it was good. Yeah. Um, kind of a lot of fighting. And then during, October, November, December time frame. Yeah, it just it died down big time. It was, was, it was it snowing a lot. Or? It was cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, we didn't get like we weren't too high. Um, we weren't like above ten thousand or anything like that. But at least our fob, we went above ten thousand a couple times. But yeah, it snowed definitely. It was cold. Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, so that first first couple of weeks, and I guess specifically your first legit real world mission where it was like shots fired and, and it felt like, fuck dude, this is the real deal. What uh, can you walk us through that experience? I think the first mission we were doing a turnover out when I first got there, the very first turnover mission we did, we ended up losing guys on a helo crash. Oh no shit. It was an accident. They didn't get shot down or anything, but um, kind of, you know, the, that uh, old adage, like the worst times on deployment is like in the turnover op or, right when you get there type of thing, you know? So unfortunately, yeah, helo crash first stop we went on. Um, we lost guys to include the air crew the, the, of the bird. So that was a big eye opener. Immediately losing teammates. It got real immediately. Um, who, uh, who was it? Uh, we was lost it? team three guy. 
Brendan Looney. Is that Adam Smith? Adam Smith, yeah. Dennis Miranda, Blake McClendon. He was one of our sport guys. This guy, um, we didn't lose him, but his name's Andrew. I'm not going to say his last name, but Andrew. Uh, he was in the, the, the Hilo, which he's a freaking animal, and he survived. Um, broke his, I believe he broke his back, but he, when they went to go recover him, he was up and moving, like helping, you know, retrieve the teammate, like his teammates and stuff yeah. like that. So he was, he was a JO, one of our JOs. So, really? Yeah. Wow. I, uh, I put Adam Smith through, tr through training. I remember him pretty, uh, yeah. pretty well, but, uh, so that was your guys' turnover up. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that was a kick in the dick to start. Uh, oh Yeah. It definitely, like, especially like the new guys and stuff like that, were like, holy shit, you know, and, you know, you're, you're close with your teammates and shit like that. So, yeah. but we, we are cheap. We had some good, lead, we had good leadership and, you know, the dudes were down for a couple of days, but they were like, they fucking put us to work immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys fucking boots on the ground, just start, start running basically right out of the gate. Yeah. That following week, we we're just right back at it again. Like, what? Hey, we got, we got ops to do. Yeah, and what were they all pretty similar, or was there a wide variety, or all pretty similar? Um, kind of, we try to expand our green zone outside our fob, just building relationship with local villages around, and then the majority of the operations we did were flyaway kind of type, um, kind of DA type missions where we go into cover of darkness, we put in some supporting elements on the high ground, and then put in the main element on the on the ground. And then we would do, we would, we would have some target packages, but we would mainly do like village clearances. And we would just go in and kind of sweep the whole village looking for, looking for turds. So and was that, uh, were there times where it was heavy resistance times with none? Like did, did that Yeah, occur? I would say about 50-50. There was heavy, on the first appointment, majority of the time, the, these dudes would just pop off at us like from a distance. Um, they would see us coming and start to take take shots. They would, I would say, they would attack the supporting elements on the high ground more than the main elements. Really, because the R SC positions, uh, supporting uh, positions, would be on the high ground. It'd be small, like three four man unit. And the majority of my first deployment, that's where I spent my time. The majority of my time were on mountaintops with like two other dudes. We had like a sniper, me, and an ADA. So you'd have a, a like a saw or a sixty, yeah. yeah. Um, what were those contacts like? I mean, was it big big groups like flanking you and moving, or just lobbing shit from? I would say like two to three dudes, and some dudes got really close. Like they would shoot us from like ri other ridge lines across. Um, I feel like they would see us like from a mile away. Yeah, we try to be, you know, covert and sneaky, but That's I feel so like these these people just know. Yeah. Shit stands out in the mountaintop. They could just, yeah. they know the deal. And they know we're there. Especially if they know we're down in the village. <clears throat> they know we got something. Yeah. We're watching them. Yeah. Did you uh, mix it up with them uh, on, on regular occasions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, initially, we know when we first got there, I would say towards the tail end of the winter time, we, we, we started to mix it up a lot with them. Yeah. Uh, were there uh, good successes with the, with the main ground maneuvering element? early on yeah it would we would and what i guess what what does that look like i think at the time the success looked like like just the hearts and minds piece like that was their success in the mission set especially going into my second one um just expanding that green that our green zone our reach our influence and you know i would say that was the overarching type goal but kind of like on the ground level we had an impact on, you know, getting rid of the, the Taliban that were there, the TB. So uh, by the time we left, um, we, we impacted the villages for sure. They wouldn't come in and fuck around with the, the locals or even try to fuck around with us. Yeah. I'm curious, the uh, in terms of like any of the instances where, let's say, if you, if you had to pick a closest call, um I know you said that most of the time you were up in uh, up in the supporting element elevated positions. I guess either way during that deployment, was there is there an operation that stands out for you personally that was like a closest call and what what happened? Yeah, so 
I was up. I was in an SE position. Um, we weren't on a high piece, very too high, I would say. But looking down into the village where the guys were coming in, um, it was me and t- two other dudes, uh, and we were just kind of. It was towards the the sun was going down. These dudes like to hit us like right when the sun is cresting, uh, for whatever reason. I don't know why, but. Maybe they thought that we were fucking most vulnerable then. We just call it tick 30 or whatever. Like every, literally every night they would do the same shit. Uh, but we were on an op and someone's about to go down. So we were kind of just whatever. We've been there all day. We're freaking smoked. And boom, just like that. They, I mean, they hit us with PKM um, to the point where we couldn't even move. I mean, it was like over our heads. We had to hunker down. We couldn't even fire back to them. And it took us forever to even find out where the hell it was coming from. Wow. Um, was it one, one no, PKM or multiple? No, it was a couple of dudes. Um, they were on the ridge just kind of north of us, like across the way, across the valley. But close, the ridge was close enough to where the rounds were, were effective. Yeah. Because um, I was down below, and we had our sniper kind of up on the top of a rock, so they had a higher position with two dudes. So we had him and this other guy or A-Dub, and me, the medic, I was just kind of below, just kind of spotting, looking for dudes. And all of a sudden, like, boom, they got stuck. I was kind of free. They were, they saw them, not me. Um, so they started fucking aiming their fire to them. My teammates couldn't move whatsoever. Like, they couldn't even get out of this little, they're in, like, this little rivet where they just hunkered down the best they could. Um, me, I ended up just grabbing the dude's A-Dub because it was down there, and fucking return and fire and could you see him i saw him event at first i couldn't <clears throat> figure out where the hell it was coming from um it wasn't until i ran on the back side of this rock and then peeked around that i could see where the rounds were coming from uh but at first i was like dude, i was looking down into the village i was like are they shooting up from high low whatever but i couldn't find it, it took a, at least a minute or two for me to figure the fuck out yeah. so was uh and by then I returned fire. They kind of, there was a lull as I was returning fire. And then the dudes were able to fucking come back to behind this like little rock ledge. And then we had um, Apaches come in at that time. Yeah. Did you end and up? then they fucking smoked them. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was your, uh, it, I mean, it sounds like your, your return fire was effective enough to get them to move, right? Yeah. I think once they heard us returning fire and then like they, they, fu- they copped out. Yeah, you know, uh, the gig was up for them. I feel like they that was like kind of like their mo. Yeah, they, they were. I would say that was lucky for them. They saw us before we saw them, and they were able to at least get rounds that were, I would say, effective. They're over our fucking heads. We had to hunker down. We couldn't move. So, yeah. um, but typically, once we return fire, they they just immediately stop or run away. Yeah, because they know we're we're calling in air support yeah. immediately. Which in this case, how long would you say from oh, the time? Probably within minutes, five minutes or something like that. We already had that on standby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Apaches were the best. How there. important are the, the Apaches? I would say very important. Yeah. The, especially on both my deployments, like them and the little birds yeah. were Saber, everything. Yeah. 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 I had an Apa- a female Apache pilot on. Uh, it's been a couple of years now. But, th- yeah, that capability, especially for as old as that um, – airframe is i mean not that it's super old but it's dozens of years mm-hmm. old you know it, it's not brand new technology i mean to me it, similarly to the a10 like that thing is still yeah super fucking effective and uh you know I, I wonder and i'm curious to get your take if you were to remove uh air support entirely you know and, and you had to battle these guys just basically mano a mano with the gear that you have which granted night vision uh, is a pretty big fucking advantage, but but even saying giving you that, um, do you think it would be almost even or or even if uh, if you were to remove? I that? think it would take advantage away from us big time, and then their mindset would probably be different. I feel like they'd be more emboldened yeah. to do shit, at least come closer, mono, you know, toe to toe with us for sure. Um, that being said, I don't think their ability or skill sets there. Yeah. As, as it pertains to like our SF abilities, um, you know, but I know they get lucky, so 
I mean, but I feel like they would be more emboldened yeah. because every time air, air support would come out, they would just dip out, ditch the weapon or whatever, and just kind of go on their mosey way because they're dressed like every other local there, you yeah. know. So, but in this case, the Apaches managed to. Wax oh yeah, them. Apaches all the time would just destroy. <laughs> yeah. They would get kills left and right. I yeah. mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many Apaches did you guys have kind of attached to, to you? Or, or how did it work that way? Basically, they weren't attached to our unit. We would just utilize them in, in our AO. But, I mean, pretty much every op we went on, we would have at least that or the little birds. Yeah. Always. Do you know uh, from where your forward operating base was uh, and where they were stationed, how, how far apart that was? They were, I believe they were in, uh, like, Kandahar. Oh, okay. And, so, which is wasn't that far from where we were. Yeah. Um, so, not not too far. Yeah, yeah, it's fucking wild. Uh, on that same deployment, is there one mission that stands out as being the big, biggest success for you guys? Yeah, we did this. Um, the first time we did it was a forty seventy two hour op. We ended up doing like this massive like village clearance, pushing through. We were there for like three days and we kind of just took over a compound. Um, but it was successful in a sense where this, this area was just being ransacked of like TB and just problem after problem. Um, and we teamed up with some, some uh, SF dudes and we linked up with them there. So um, it was a, in a sense of that, as far as clearing this village was huge. Um, and uh, an operation standpoint for our unit was big because it was the first time we ever did anything like that as far as doing multiple uh nights in the, in the village where we kind of fortified we took over this this, this guy's compound it was huge but we ended up taking it over we built like sandbagged it out you know just fucking hunkered down and just owned it and it was good in that sense and a lot of lessons learned but um i feel like on the first point that was probably our most successful one and it was our funniest one because <laughs> we ended up burning this like the guy's lifetime <laughs> of firewood in like two days. <laughs> Finding firewood in Afghanistan is like one of the hardest things to do. There's no, tr yeah. there's not really many trees and. Yeah. So what I mean, what do they do to fucking keep warm then? They just I don't know. They I mean that's they they have wood, but it costs a lot of money. Yeah, so that's but, it's a uh, premium. Man. Oh yeah, it's premium. Everyone was getting sick and shit like that because we're on top of each other. It was pretty funny though. It was a pretty fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> was there any uh, any pranks? Any good pranks in the entire deployment? Any good pranks or hazings? Fuck it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I got a hazing one. Uh, we're on our base. We're with other like an army unit, and one night, you know, we're fucking wanted to, to mess with them. Uh, not our own guys, but the army guys. We would like lob smoke grenades in their fucking <laughs> into their B huts and stuff like that. And they would then they shot like pencil flares over at our fucking at us, and it was pretty funny. And I believe that night, dudes were uh, it was kind of like a chill night where have like you know maybe a glass of, <laughs> of whiskey or something like that. I don't know. Blood. I can't really recall. I, I don't condone it, but <laughs> we had we had some fun that night. That was funny. It definitely backlash, but it was funny as so. hell. Yeah. <laughs> That's good shit. Um, all right, so that deployment, uh, you said it, it picked back up towards the end? Yeah, it picked back up towards the end after the – I would say in the, the winter time, it was like a couple times a month maybe they would try to get after us. Yeah. We, and then we went on ops. We still try to remain active. We didn't go out as much because in the winter time, half the time the freaking – the assets are down because of weather. Yeah. So they – and we always did flyaways too. So, especially in the first one, we never really patrolled anywhere. We did a little bit, but not very far. Yeah. Um, so we went out like a handful of times during those months. Did you guys ever have any incidences with IEDs? None that we set off yeah. or our partner for us set off, but we, our EOD guys like diffused a lot. Yeah. Did you guys have any dogs? With yeah, you? we did. How, uh, any good dog stories? And were they uh, West Coast, East Coast handlers? We had a West Coast handler when, at the time, I believe they, like, shifted over to, like, sub-packed or something like that for a temporary amount so of time. this is, what, like, 2010? 2010, yeah. Oh, shit. What was the first name of the though. handler, can you say? His name's uh, Etchy. He's oh, a first-phase instructor. Yeah, shit, I mean. Yeah, he's out now, Etchy. Yeah. 
So he Kane, was my first phase so instructor. you were with Kane overseas. Yeah. Oh, shit. So he joined us um, not right away, but he was there probably like he came in like two months into it. Yeah. And then he was with us the remainder of the time. Um, awesome. But he, that dog crushed it. Yeah, that dog is one of the best dogs. Yeah. Ever. So I, I, I was a trainer out there then. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Kane, so the myself and Wayne <clears throat> Dodge were were on that contract for uh, for the West Coast Canine Program. So, Kane was a dog that we put through his first uh, first workup to deploy, obviously with you guys. So that's fucking wild, man. God damn, what a small and It was funny to see at you, too, because he put me through first phase. So yeah. we're like, holy shit. Yeah, he is one of the funniest guys <laughs> oh, yeah. ever. Like, the, the shit, I mean, I don't know if you remember. I, I mean, he, he fucked with most students, but oh yeah, the, the shit that he would do, like, with the incoming guys in their dress whites, like, I couldn't even be around for it because I couldn't keep a straight fucking yeah. face. <laughs> like, I just totally would blow it, and, and they would they would know he's fucking with them, but... Like the, just the shit that he would say to him and do to him, and God damn, yeah, it was I, funny. He was. I remember him as an instructor. He was a fucking hoot and like yeah. a jokester, like in a sense where he would just say things to students and like make it entertaining. Yeah. Well, I, I think the what always impressed me the most about, from a sense of humor standpoint, his ability to be sarcastic and say something that's clearly not serious. Yeah. But be totally serious while he's saying it, and just. Like some of the most ridiculous shit would come out of his mouth, like off the cuff. God damn, he's funny. He's uh, he's in your area as a firefighter. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's in uh, yeah, <clears throat> up in L.A. area. Yeah, you guys ever do any cop versus firefighter boxing matches? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's always us for a cent. They're the they're our, you know nation's heroes, man. Yeah. No one likes cops. They like yeah, firemen. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> there, was, there was one here that just booted a fucking homeless dude that was all over the news. I think uh, I saw a that a week or two ago. Like, there's video like of him. Kicked his like, ass. I, yeah, I didn't even watch the video. I, I, I mean, to me, I don't need to see that. I can, you know, see the headline and know that it, that's a shitty deal. Not but, good. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is a such a contrast firefighter to to a cop. Uh, yeah. Around here, I mean, fuck everywhere. But he's he's doing actually good things because one of my police academy instructors knows him, and he told me like he's he's crushing it. He, yeah, he loves that's it. Awesome. But uh, all right, so Kane was there. Um, I, I guess the from the standpoint of your guys' efficacy and your reliance on the dogs and the relationship of of the platoon and the handler and the canine, can you uh, kind of describe that? The relationship was good because I mean, Etching and Kane liked to really have the dog interact with us. Um, he never he didn't really s- separate it from us too often. Like he would let it hang out with us when we were just back at the fob work with the dog i did a lot i did a training with the dog um i personally did quite a few times i would just dress up like mooge and yeah. do some training while i was muzzled um i like to do that uh so i got some good experience with working with kane that way and then yeah he was always in the front too with our eod guys and our point man and stuff like that too yeah. so he was always integrated and that we the dog was integrated throughout my entire workup too so oh, we're wow. all the whole platoon was pretty much familiar with handling dogs and yeah. how to they did a good job on letting us work with them in a sense as hey we're doing clearance how to direct the dog like i personally throughout training i remember doing it multiple times through like salk and doing clearances and stuff like that like they would let the dog loose and you would direct it because the handler would be way back there yeah dog run through the house you'd so help direct find the dude yeah. um which i always found interesting too yeah, I mean, you know, that environment takes a, a very special and specific dog. No no two ways about it. Uh, and Kane was absolutely one of them. I mean, if, if I, you know, thinking of my time of the, there was, you know, uh, about 15 dogs overall that, that I interacted with, trained, worked with while while I was there. And, and uh, you know, he, he's absolutely in, in the top three of, of my favorite there. Um, if I had to pick one, like all around dog, it would probably be him. Honestly, you know, like to, yeah. to clone and to make as as many as you could. I mean, in terms of him being well rounded and social and all that, I I believe he's still alive. Actually, um, the last time I talked to Etchy, um, did yeah, he keep him or no? Yeah, yeah oh, he I mean, did. He hangs out with a fucking golden retriever laying on the couch in his house, like. And and I don't know if you ever caught him uh, in a bite suit or not, but uh, he was for sure an above average, well above average dog. That yeah, way. I never did the bite suit with him. I only did when he was muzzled. Yeah, no, he he has, and he fucking knocked my ass to the ground. I specifically yeah. remember that why because I fell and I 
filleted my finger open. I had to get <laughs> medevaced. <laughs> no shit. Dead serious. Dude. I had to get a muzzled I, dog fucked you up. Well, I fell to the ground just like to fight with him. Uh, yeah. No, and no. somehow I don't even know. Like I sliced my finger. Yeah. And no, yeah, the muzzle shit's rough. I mean, they'll fucking break ribs, and I mean, they they fuck you up uh, in a muzzle even. But but uh, man, it's such a fucking small world. That's cool that you were there with him. Um, was he there during that three day? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yep, yeah. he was. That's fucking good stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right, so the last uh, part of that deployment, did you do anything different, or was it just more of the same? It, more of the same, more yeah. or less. And then towards the tail end, and we just got kind of ready to get yeah. the hell out of there. Who uh, who relieved you guys? Uh, I can't remember. Team 2, maybe? Yeah. But I believe they shut. They ended up shutting it down. Oh, no shit. Fob down. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you didn't do a turnover op with them or anything? No. Yeah. Um, all right. So when you went home, how quick of a turnaround was it? Did you do your Columbia deployment between the two? or No, did I did. I got home, did that whole thing, break, you know, took some leave, took some time off, and then we went right back into it, work up again. Yeah. And I did Afghanistan. Did you get any, any better schools on, on your second time around? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, did I'm doing like TSO, which is my another Intel school. It's mainly focusing on like surveillance and physical and technical surveillance. Uh, did some more medical courses. Um, by then, I was doing like more leadership schools too because I was like, old, I wouldn't say older guy, but I was older in a sense where there was a lot of new guys at that point. Yeah. So do more leadership schools. So. It was good. Um, I really liked like the Intel piece, so I really enjoyed that. Um, did more like level two training um, because when I did when my second deployment, that was like my main, my secondary job outside of being a medic. Yeah. Reason I liked it because we, when I noticed in Afghanistan, a lot of our ops were developed internally. They weren't passed down from higher. Like, hey, go after this guy. It was more like, what do we got? What's in our yeah. AO? So it's more like sort. the traditional Vietnam yeah. style. And yeah. we de that definitely played an effect in the second deployment because everything we did was self-driven. Oh, mean, no shit. We developed our own intel um, on what we we talked to with the, the villagers and what myself and my, my other teammate collected. So. Yeah. All right, so you, you go through some good schools, do your work up. Uh, now you get ready to go back over. Um, what time of year was that, and, and how does the second uh, deployment compare to your first? It was the same time of year. Because I was still on Team Four, we always had the same exact cycle throughout pretty much end of the summer, throughout the holidays, and then we were there for eight months this time. So first time was like six, because at the time they were dabbling with this whole new initiative, VSO Village Stability Operations, came about in like 2012, mm -hmm. and so that was a new mission set, more of way more like hearts and minds. Hey, we we need to embed guys there longer to hold those relationships because this quick turnaround is this not accomplishing anything because before we got there i believe team 10 was there for damn near a year holy fuck 11 and some change yeah um so we go to afghanistan into this we relieve team two team two guys i mean and they're in this place like god it was in the middle of nowhere it's it the same province i was last time kind of uh, just north in the same valley too but north of where we were but it was in a bowl surrounded by mountains next to one little village. And pretty much it was like a f less than a football field in diameter of Hesco's. And like these guys, we lived in like Alaskan tents. And we went to relieve team two. I mean, I mean, there was no water. There was no toilets. The kitchen was made of dirt. I mean, it was like rugged living for sure. And these guys were hanging out dry you know, hanging themselves out there, especially because uh, they, they started it up. Yeah. They were told, like, at the end of their deployment, hey, go start this VSO site up and in bed with the village there and start doing work. And then when we got there, we took it over, and it was like, wow, uh, definitely a different way of life on that second deployment. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, In terms of the, uh, the lack of luxuries, I guess, uh, was it like water buffaloing? What, like, did you bring in water buffaloes or water? Or cases yes. Of fucking bottled water or what? Bottled water. They would uh, 
so this place you can you couldn't drive to at all. Um, no mobility platforms. It was all um, airdrops. They would do like um, triwall airdrops from fucking planes to drop in food, water, ammo, etc. cetera. Uh, helos pretty much could only get there. And we'd have, we had a water buffalo, and they would dump, like, fuel to us. Um, we were living in Alaskan tents on cots. That's a rough fucking go for seven, seven months, eight months? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we'd had no showers. We are like, using water bottles. We, we'd, like, use, like, this little stream next to our, our fob. No way to clean our clothes. Like, we were shitting in ammo can like, the fucking wood ammo cans with bags for a long time. Yeah. Um, in terms of the shower component, uh, when I was in Iraq, I mean, I went about two months, uh, about two months without a shower. So you didn't really take a shower that whole time. I, I didn't take a shower till damn near four months in. And then yeah. we had like a shower. We had a little, then we ended up getting some like these Israeli showers. They were just like <laughs> the little bags you hang up. I think they yeah. sent us one, um, I see, you know what I, I see 90 or whatever they call yeah. them. Um, and it had a shower in it. They, like, had to connect water to it. But that thing broke in a matter of two days. The other side had a washer and dryer in it. But that broke in a matter of a day. Because we had no way to sustain it. The, the shower Connex box turned into a whack shack yeah. fucking quick, <laughs> That's exactly it? what it turned into. <laughs> so that fucking broke. Uh, and it, we ended up just taking trucker showers. Yeah. Just fucking wet wipes. I did, anyway. I said, fuck it. I'm surprised you didn't do, like, the sunbag showers. You know, like uh, the camping fucking Yeah, showers. we didn't have that. I, I think one of it did, but like once we got the little Israeli bag shower, it's like, it's like a camp shower. Yeah. You just fill it up and you just dump it on your head. Yeah, the uh, surefire way to, to sell anything, make it sound more tactical or sexy, is just throw Is- Israeli, Israeli in front of it. <laughs> Israeli bandage. This is fucking Israeli, Israeli pen. <laughs> so you can stab people with it, starts fires, it's got a laser in it. It's a knife sharpener. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Israeli everything. Uh, I love it. And it... Uh, it pisses everybody off over there too, right? Oh well, yeah, these are Israeli showers. And our can't f- use them. CBN built building like some shitters for us because we we're like everyone got fucking horrifically sick because like just that way it was set up and like our shitters were fucking horrific. And so our one of our CBs ended up building us like some shitters that are like basically like big porta potties, which helped out, but which we could actually sit on a toilet seat, like kind of like a fucking regular toilet. Yeah. Um, so you guys got like sick, uh, like stomach yeah just bad stuff. stomach everyone was down hard yeah it was just like i don't even know what it was but yeah. i mean the the unsanitary conditions i mean over time i mean fucking who who knows i mean yeah we were eating mres we had no means of cooking because we had we ended up getting like propane tanks eventually and we had like a little makeshift stove um but we weren't cooking like good food. We ended up using like building like a fire and just cooking over the fucking fire. Yeah, but um, just warming MREs up. Just warming. They would airdrop us some food. Like eventually, that we did. We had we had eventually set up like an Alaskan tent with like drinks and like food. And we had like a couple. They ended up dumping us some like a meat freezer. We could stick some food in, but it, it wasn't like they weren't throwing us like steaks and shit. So, what, I mean, what was what was the food? Just like shit? frozen food, like frozen shit food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> shit food. It was. It was. It wasn't, it wasn't good. We had like an army, little army detachment with us too. Oh, and we yeah. had a cook. One of one of the guys was a cook. Yeah, that poor bastard. That fucker was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> we used to make fun of him so bad. <laughs> we like he looked like Private uh, Pile. We thought he was going to kill somebody because our buddies. Our, you could imagine like four, three or four months in, like these fucking pissed off disgruntled team guys, yeah. like. Surprised it wasn't taped up, taped to the shitter, fucking. <laughs> oh yeah. Time. God damn. One time he tried to cook our fucking food, and he started the fire with diesel fuel, and then oh, you geez. could imagine how that turned out. Our food <laughs> tasted like diesel fuel. That pissed people off. Oh uh, fuck! Was there anything that he made that was worth a shit? Is there one thing that he was like, "Yeah, this isn't too bad"? No, he didn't make one thing that was worth a shit. <laughs> he was supposed to make us food like breakfast. He made us breakfast one time. He literally just microwaved like he warmed up fucking french toast sticks and like set them out in the fucking like <laughs> a big fuck you like hey <laughs> oh, christ he's got like the you got one job or like yeah just I mean, his name is like timmy or something like that yeah he had yeah. one fucking job and he's yeah. and he's it's like the guy that paints around the rock on the fucking uh on the street street lines or whatever yeah he, he ended up being just like worthless yeah um, fucking christ man that's tough did uh so i mean for that 
you were there eight months for that whole stint, right? Yeah. Of that eight months, did you eat MREs pretty much the whole time? I would say like three, four, like halfway. Yeah. And then we got like that frozen foods. We ate that. We brought, I brought food, like brought like a bunch of snacks, ate a lot of local food. Oh, no shit. Yeah. What, uh, is there a uh, most interesting local food that you ate that you actually like liked? Yeah, this rice, and they would put like these big chunks of potato in it. It's like just a bunch of carbs, but it's fucking good. Yeah. And then we get a lot of their, their foot bread. We call it foot bread, but like they're fucking <laughs> non because they yeah. make it with their feet. Yeah. I mean, we, I think it was a joke. I personally have never seen them make it with their feet, but they would just say, yeah, we'll get some foot bread because they pound it flat with their feet. But and, we would uh, eat that a lot. Or would eat Because we had on our fob, well, next to us, we had ANA. A NSF, whatever, NASF dudes attached to us. So there was like 15 of that, 20 of them. They yeah. lived in like this little hooch, this little wooden mud hut outside of our little fob. Mm -hmm. Inside of our fob, we had um, some locals too that lived with us actually. Really? They were called CMRG. <clears throat> um, don't ask me what that stands for because I can't remember, but it basically were their EOD yeah. dudes. Um, they would carry in their back like the Thors, uh, um, the Jammers, and they would. They were freaking good. They were shit hot. Yeah. I we loved working with them. I personally worked with them all the time because I was like their handler because I was an Intel dude. I'd pay them and make sure though know, they're squared away with gear. Their family's good to go. Um, just make sure they were good. And I would always eat with them a lot because they'd get food from in the village and bring it in. What uh, two questions? I guess what what were you paying them? Like how much? Do you remember? Yeah, I think it was like 500 bucks a week. They're making some good money. Like each? Yeah. And you're giving them cash, I'm assuming. Cash, yeah. Yeah, American Afghani cash. money. Oh, Afghani money. Yeah, but like um, equivalency of American yeah. dollars. I mean, how how are you getting that? Is that part of the airdrop as they give you cash to pay these Yeah, guys? well, I would fly into our little AOB where we our head show was staged, where our manager who manages this stuff, like the money and the yeah. intel and stuff, would give me me and my other guy um, who has passed, but me and him worked side by side. Um, they would give us money. Issue yeah. us a, like a big bundle of money and be like, you know, here's basically keep a log and pay them yeah. on their, their schedule. And how much were you skimming? Oh, at least two, you know, two, three percent at the top. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you said the guy you were working with passed. Was he an American guy? Yeah, he was a SEAL. His name Blake Marston. He passed oh. in training. Oh, okay. We're, Skydiving. Yeah, fuck, man. Let's do that. He, he, yeah, he, when he was in, uh, he just got to silver. Oh, okay. Fuck, and man. it was a training accident. Yeah, that's too bad. Fuck. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's an interesting component, I think, of uh, that a lot of times you don't realize or hear about uh you know but getting the the support of the locals i mean that that in and of itself can be dicey and that even something as simple as food like how do you know it's not fucking poison like how, you know how, how much of a trust based relationship do you have to to grow into before you're willing to eat food that these people are yeah. getting and whatever you know it took a while to i would say to develop those relationships um as soon as they realized we were going to be there for quite some time they kind of warmed up to us yeah um and then we had the our inside with those CMRG guys that kind of befriended them and they're yeah. like our conduit yeah, and really helped us out. <clears throat> we had a problem with our first NSF crew where we had to kick them out and get a new crew because there was like, we didn't, we had them calling in some like CI dudes to interview them counter Intel dudes because there was some like insider threat. Like these dudes were like, hated, they didn't like us. They wanted to fucking hurt us because I, they were accusing us of one op for like knocking down. Like they legit accused us like we thought knocked down a Quran on the ground and, you know, fucking dishonored it and this whole thing. Like, and then they, we, we got some like insight like, hey, these dudes are, they don't fucking like you. And then we ended up not trusting them. Hey, you can't come on base. You can't come on base. It definitely can't come on base armed. Yeah. So leave your shit over there. Yeah. Um, like, what's the point? So though? basically, the relationship became bad. Yeah. We got a new crew, but. Oh. Um, with the crew that the EOD crew that you trusted, they were they from that area? No, they're like northern Ira Afghanistan. Okay, um, so they were basically liaisoning with the locals, but they're uh, from there, so they can speak the language yep. and culture. They're Afghani's, yeah, um, but they're from the north, and they hate 
Basically, like the northern Afghanis hate the Pashtuns and yeah. hate definitely hate Taliban. Yeah. So they fucking, they were the true to me, the most patriotic Afghanis I've ever worked with. Yeah. I mean, they loved their country. They they were there for the right reasons. Yeah. Um, they were motivated. They weren't motivated by money. Um, you know, they, of course, they wanted to get paid because they had family support and support themselves. But yeah, they're 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 motivated. Yeah, that's. And they were shit hot too. We trust them more than. Pfft, or ANSF guys. Yeah. I did personally. Yeah. Did you ever eat any uh, meat from the locals? Yeah. What, uh, like goat or what? Yeah, goat. Was it worth the fuck? Some of it was worth the shit. It was, some of it was really, really good. Um, but I've also had one where it was just horrific. It was just like a bowl of fucking grease. Like, I don't even know how the <laughs> fuck they cooked it, but I think that's when people got sick because it was just like a bowl, a pot of like, like a carcass in there and you just had to like peel it off. But yeah. Was that the nastiest thing you ate? Over that was there? probably the nastiest thing yeah. I ate. Is there a, a weirdest thing? No, not really. Nothing, nothing too like out of the ordinary with, yeah. with food. I kept it real basic. I tried to eat towards the later the, the deployment. I tried to eat more local food because I was just so sick of fucking yeah, MRs our and American bullshit. bullshit food they send us. The uh, was there any like American stuff there, like Snickers bars or potato chips or anything like that, or were they eating solely like staple stuff? The locals? Yeah. Yeah, they would just eat local food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so on that deployment, uh, it sounds like that one was maybe a little more active. Oh, yeah. Fighting-wise. Can we uh, get into that? Pretty much right out the gate. Um, once Team 2 left, did a turnover op smooth. So unlike the first one, this deployment, all we were doing is just patrolling. Patrol to where we needed to go to handle business. Um, didn't do too many flyaways like we did in the first deployment, but, I mean, Base attacks there were a nightly thing. I mean, every single night at like 7, 7.30, we'd like I joked about it earlier, but tick 30, legitimately every night we would get into it. And these dudes would get, were, were close. I mean, they would come up on the ridge line just like north of us, and it's probably 800 meters you know, to the top or something like that. So their small arms is effective. I mean, it's small arms is littered, you know, they peppered our entire like um, – Alaskan tent while we're sleeping in there. Thank God didn't hit anybody. IDF was a normal thing. Yeah. So they were affected. They would lob over that ridge line their IDF into ours and we'd get lucky. Yeah. What uh, was there a watch set up where you guys had? 50, yeah, we had twenty four hour watch. We had two guys, um, basically on a guard tower, um, two guard towers, and our little fucking VSO site was pretty beefed up, and we had a mini gun. We had a one twenty. We had you know, Mark 19s on every corner. I mean, we were fortified. We definitely had enough ammo and weaponry to fucking handle business. We did every time we got into a tick. But that being said, just because our position, um, it, just terrain-wise, it was poor. Yeah. We, were, we yeah. lacked the advantage there. Yeah. Um, and that, every time we went out, too, they would, we would mix it up with them. Yeah, every time. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. At night, uh, I know you said around dusk, were there ever in the middle of the night they'd fucking try to overrun the base or anything like that? No. No, never had the balls to do that. But to me, that's kind of surprising. I, mean, I don't know if it's that it's the fear of the unknown of close air support being nearby or, or not or whatever. I, mean, I don't know how close they were. I'm assuming similar to last time is that you get them on station fairly quick. But yeah. I, I guess from your perspective, I mean, if let's say 2 in the morning, there's a group of fucking 100 of them, that just fucking try to storm your base. Like they're probably going to be able to get away with that. Right. Oh yeah. I, I feel mean. like they would just because the n numbers out. Yeah. You know. I, mean, I mean, there's, there's been times where we've been in, um, our ANA guys have been in, um, firefights right in the green zone where their base was like dudes crept up, not like a big squad of TB, but five or six dudes. And they would just, they hammered it. They got into a little, a firefight. Yeah. So that's close. I was within like a hundred yards of our Bob. Yeah. So it was damn, it was, wasn't up, up on us because we kind of crested this hill and then they were kind of beneath us and then the green zone. So they would sneak through the green zone, fucking fire at their little hooch where the, they stood watch too. Yeah. And they would get after it. But wow. Never in the middle of the night they would try to attack. Not in the middle of the night. Yeah. No. It's always dusk. That's interesting. I wonder if it's like a night vision thing where. You know, if it goes horribly bad, they can try to disappear into the dark. But yeah. there's enough light to see you to start it. That's the only thing I could think of, maybe. But 
And I had a guy that I worked with like this for Intel wise, he would provide me Intel um, about attacks that would come nightly. And I gave him, I vetted him the best I could. Um, and he was good to go. And he was eventually paid off every single time because I didn't give him this a strobe, like this little tiny IR strobe. And I told him, hey, anytime you get some like Intel that these dudes are going to be attacking us, I want you to go up on this. Like there's like another ridge line off in the distance past the village and like hold, turn it on. It's fucking uh, damn sure every night he would turn that bitch on. They would attack us right right before it. Boom. It was IR strobe? It was IR strobe. Yeah. was like a, those old school like green ones, like yeah. the brick. Yeah. Um, Holy fuck, man. Because that was the only way I could communicate with him. Yeah. Uh, or he could communicate with us. He would come in, in the middle of the night and meet with us deliver our, our footbread he was like our guy to deliver the footbread <laughs> and then yeah he would deliver his food like that was his excuse to come on base yeah what uh what were you paying him to do that i think it was a couple hundred bucks each time yeah wow he probably made a fucking killing oh yeah he cr- yeah a <laughs> couple hundred, like a hundred <laughs> two hundred dollars there i mean he was crushing it the cmrg guys were killing it with paying them like yeah. They were living large. All of a sudden, sudden families he's driving a care. fucking Mercedes. Yeah. And they're like, wait a minute. What's <laughs> Their this families were doing? taken care of. <laughs> oh, that's a fucking trip, man. It's funny how shit like that works. I mean, it's like, I don't care where you go in the world or, or what you're doing. Like, there's always a network. There's always a fucking inside gig. You know, it's... Yep. Human nature is uh, is fascinating that way. But um, so in terms of the, the now you're patrolling instead of doing flyaways and things like that, that obviously makes it more personal and... Uh, and, and you're kind of embedded there with the same same group, basically. I mean, um, similar questions to the last deployment. Was there a closest call uh, on that deployment that, that sticks out? Yeah, I'd say it happened quite a few times, actually. But uh, same thing, like patrolling through a village, coming up Crescent, like kind of over a ridge line to go back down to a valley, boom, hit, uh, hunkered down, like pretty much the whole platoon. Was, was stuck behind this little rock wall was probably about two feet high effective fire we couldn't even get up we eventually started returning fire and then they backed off but super close um super effective fire and then a second time i could recall vividly was like the first time where me personally and a lot of the guys that we worked to did like land nav tactics like we flanked right fucking online flank right yeah. and fucking assault through like no shit i ads out at no Nyland. shit i ads yeah yeah That's it was like the first time for me i was like holy shit like doing you know imts like up they see me i'm down fucking boom boom fire yeah f- flanking right up through up along the the river because they were like in the green zone pretty close within like 100 yards shooting at us and we could see him kind of running around and fuck it was like Fucking one, you know, basic shit. Get online. Yeah. Fucking squad two flank right. Go up the river. <laughs> boom. We salt through. It was, it worked. And yeah. I was like, now I can remember that vividly because it was like the first time we ever utilized. I personally have ever utilized that in combat. Yeah. Like so, the legit training stuff. Yeah. That we do. For, for those of you listening, that I apologize for the heavy acronym stuff. IADs are immediate action drills, which is what he's talking about. We're like, we spent a lot of time training. Uh, for land warfare, land uh, land operations, where uh, as, as a group you're basically responding to to fire, right? So if you're patrolling in a in a straight line and you get contacted, the front, the, the left, the right, the rear, whatever is is how do you respond in relation to the terrain and and you know the contact and and obviously there's a lot of things that are pretty dynamic that dictate uh, what you do and how you do it, but there's some basic principles of movement that you utilize so that you're essentially always bringing guns to bear on wherever you're being contacted from. There's always people shooting while other groups are moving and you're flanking or moving back or leapfrogging or moving forward or, you know, whatever. Again, it, it varies dramatically, but that's cool to hear that uh, you were doing that shit for real. Yeah. I never, I would never forget that. Cause it was like just one specific instance. That was, we ended up doing it a couple other times, but that one in particular was really kind of that, the basics of just, Hey, get online, flank, right. Yeah. And it, and it fucking worked. I mean, it was, well, interesting enough, how dynamic you know real world shit is is like there were civilians in between us too, yeah. Like running around in the green, like farmers and stuff like that. So it was it was kind of hard to delineate you know who's yeah. that because they would just pop out of nowhere sometimes, yeah. And they'd be like legit in the middle of a gunfight. Um, 
it was weird. Like some of our guys almost shot him, you know, like fucking people running through. Cause yeah. dude, dudes are amped up, you know, yeah. we're getting fired at. And next thing you know, you see this head just fucking pop out and you're just yeah. you know, immediately just try to get, get to guns. But yeah, it, it's hard for anybody, even myself included. I mean, I've, I've been out long enough to where I, you know, I'm used to living in, in our society. Obviously I've seen, seen the other side, but, um, you know, for, for people that, that complain about how shitty and oppressive and fucked up this country is like, try to imagine that, you know, yeah. on the, on the city streets here, buildings getting blown up and, you know, family members being, you know, caught in crossfire or some of them are, are fighting the, you know, the, the forces that are here doing things and, and having things like that happen in your fucking neighborhood are, are almost impossible to even try to imagine. No, he's absolutely, you know, and, and that's the, the bitch of it. There's a lot of places uh, in this world where that's a, a daily and normal occurrence uh, for stuff like that. I just, uh, I, I hope that people, um, you know, can appreciate the, the perspective shift and, and hopefully have a little, little more positive outlook on, uh, on how things are here, even as, as irritated and frustrated as you may get sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, um, so lots of close calls with that where you guys didn't lose anybody and uh, nobody took, took any rounds or, or got hit or no, nope, not in our, we lost a, 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 one of our partner force dudes. That's it. Yeah. Shot um, like, one of our CMRG guys, he got on an op, he got shot in the head. Yeah. Uh, ballpark of, uh, in terms of enemy KIA for that deployment. Couple hundred, hundred, yeah. yeah. Only two over I don't know exactly, but it was it was it was a lot. Yeah. What uh, what was the kind of the overall feeling of of your group? Uh, and was it one platoon uh, task element? I mean, how yeah. Many, how many guys? Sixteen, thirty. It was, yeah, sixteen, uh, twenty seals, and then we had like ten army guys. Okay. So about thirty of us on that fob. Okay, and uh, generally speaking, I mean, was the morale high for you guys at that point i know it, it seems like militarily i mean i got out at the end of 08 and just a couple of years later when i came back on the west coast for the canine training position it seemed like morale had had taken a bit of a dive with uh, with that administration being in office and funding had been cut and it just seemed like guys were, were kind of fucking miserable yeah i think it, during that workup it kind of ebbed and flowed dude the morale was kind of low and then once we start getting ready to go Afghanistan again, dudes fucking got fired up because they know we're going to, especially the platoon where we went, um, we knew we were going to be getting after it. I mean, we just knew. Uh, yeah. So we were, the morale was high, but then the morale went down towards the end of that deployment because dudes being there for that long got fucking sick of each other. Yeah. And then we got sick of dealing with just the mission in general because there's more, at the end it was more of, Let's patrol to contact, and then let's more focus on shaking hands and kissing babies. Yeah, you know, not really doing, not really going after the fucking bad dudes. Yeah, um, which need to be taken care of. Uh, it was more of like, hey, let's rebuild, let's build these people bridges, let's you know build them school, which is which is all necessary and needed, but it ended up being just hundred percent focused on that. And dudes got real pissed off, yeah. and they got just just disgruntled. Like, why the fuck am I going to go risk my ass? and build a bridge and the next yeah. thing we're leaving they're just gonna destroy it which they did yeah and we ended up destroying that fob anyway we left no one's there anymore yeah so what area was that Argadab valley yeah. same, same same area yeah. same province yeah I, you know i am curious uh i know every platoon is different but for for your experience from your experience going to afghanistan either time both times did did you feel like your leadership um sat you guys down and gave you a clear cut here is why we're here here's what we're trying to accomplish or was it very piecemealed i think it was piecemeal as we needed it as like as time went on yeah i think at, on my second deployment i had great leadership both deployments because a lot of uh, the same people carried over to the second deployment um so we had a relationship there but i think on the second deployment when it came to that tipping point of the fuck are we doing here like this is a waste of time because seals seals don't want to just go there and just build shit yeah you know that's not what we're meant to do so that's when they really like hammered home like this is the why this is what we're doing this is the mission this is the focus and really kind of broke it down to our level 
and why they're getting pushed this cr- shit and they push it on us. Yeah. Um, which was nice, but that being said, dudes didn't like it anyway because they didn't like the mission. But um, I felt they did a good job. At least my leadership um, did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel, um, I guess you personally, like from the 30,000 foot view uh, standpoint, did you feel like you knew why as a country we are there and, and felt good about it? Is that is that something that came across your radar or, or was it more, hey, I signed up to do this? Yeah, I don't think I ever like really sat down and kind of went through that in my own head and like yeah. why we here. I'm more just down and in. Yeah kind of mindset yeah no i mean looking i was back that's how i felt it was yeah do you feel more analytical that way now at, at your stage in life than you were back uh, when you were no doing? now i'm more up and out like way more big picture now yeah now i pay attention to it more yeah um what's going on in the world and just yeah. life in general yeah now yeah. that i'm out I, i'm right there with you i mean uh, my time was in iraq but similarly like i never thought hey should we be here should we not i think operationally it's it's actually important to just focus on yeah. the things that that you have the ability to 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 deal with and control sort of uh and not really think about it that way because it, it really doesn't matter at that point i mean no. you know but I, I know now like being in my 40s there's no way i could do stuff like that you know and not know what the fuck's going on mm-hmm. and, and feel good about why why we're doing what we're doing but and, and maybe that's why that's part a big part of why war fighting is such a young man's game for the for the most part. Absolutely. Obviously the physical part's huge too, but I don't think physically I could fucking still still run at that pace. But um uh, so similar question in terms of big bi- biggest success and did you have dogs with you on that deployment? Yeah, we had a dog um that worked with us. So at this time the dogs the handlers were dudes from our platoon. Like they would farm out. They got, you know, kind of that. That was a new initiative. Um, yeah. So they took a who, volunteer. Hey, who wants to be more of a senior dude? Who yeah. wants to be a handler? And they would go to the school. And they would come back. And they would do the full workup with us. Yeah. So the dog was a very integral part of our yeah, platoon. That's cool. What was the dog's name? Uh, Blitz, I think. Blitz. Um, the handler, um, his first name is Josh. But, uh, Great dog, um, good to go. Found a lot of uh, IEDs. Yeah, uh, and yeah, he was an integral part of our platoon. Like he was part of. The, he was a teammate for yeah. sure because we had him from the beginning. Yeah. Did, uh, uh, any bites? No bites. No bites. Not that but he so he was living in that same shitty environment with. Yeah, you he was. Time. Just yeah. to, uh, would they just airdrop dog food for him? Airdrop dog food for him. Um, initially, the handler was living in the last content with like. 10 other dudes, but then eventually we ended up building his own little bee hut yeah. with the dog yeah, to separate him. Yeah. Cause then I mean, it was just too difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Fucking middle of the night, people coming in and out, like that'd be a fucking nightmare. Yeah. And you got, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we like made in the last content, it can only hold so many people. We ended up using the parachute to make like these little dividers. So we have our own little three by three cubicle in there. Mm-hmm. Our own little, some privacy. Yeah. Um, but it's just, too, yeah, exactly. A little, <laughs> little whack shack in there. But it's just too small for yeah. the the kennel and the yeah. du- and the handler is just too much. Yeah. The uh, the overall demeanor of the dog throughout the deployment. Did you see a shift in in him living that way, getting you know with the contacts nonstop? Did he did he seem to change at all, or was he pretty even keeled? I think he was even keeled. Yeah. Dog, dog was locked on. Yeah. For sure. Uh, he never he never changed uh, one bit actually. Even yeah. during contacts, he was fucking solid. Solid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, from a success standpoint, is there an operation or a, a thing that stands out as being the most successful during that deployment? I'd just say that whole deployment was a success, in my opinion, because it's just of what we got to do mm-hmm. um, and the experiences we had. Yeah, at the end of the day, we got rid of it. I mean, we burned it down to the ground. Uh, so you burn it like and then left yeah legitimately how, how was that was that kind of a liberating <laughs> feeling or was it bitter got as much, everything out of there and we le- legit set it to fire like yeah. we let the hescos but like everything everything we couldn't bring threw it all in there and yeah. lit it on fire with diesel fuel was there was there a bitter sweetness to that? yeah it was a bittersweet for sure and dudes were, and it was kind of like at the same time um dudes were pissed Dudes were like, what a happy, you know, it's kind of like a bittersweet type thing. Cause it's like, Hey, we did all this freaking work. 
built that thing from the ground up. Yeah. You know, fucking risk our ass out there. And next thing you know, it's like pack up shop, get the fuck out. Yeah. That place is a, it's a loss. We're going to write that place off as a loss. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it was so, it was just too difficult to really make an impact, I would say. Yeah. On to, to have an influence with where we're at, the amount of people logistically and the resources we we're able to give the people. It wasn't, and it was such a high threat area. Like no one wanted to come there. No yeah. one, no, no one wanted to come. No asset wanted to come. Helos barely wanted to come drop people off there because every time they came in, they would get shot at. Yeah. So they were like, fuck that. We ain't coming. And, irrespective of weather and time of year there's no way to drive in and out of there no so i mean how were the locals they <clears throat> all on foot donkey fucking packing shit in yeah there? wow that, that is fucking remote we had to cross the river every single day yeah the argonaut river and fucking get soaked that was a part of our daily routine was literally just like crossing the fucking river river crossing every day how deep was it <clears throat> oh some parts over your head yeah and then other parts we like ankle knee deep yeah waist deep shitty water or clean it was dirty yeah, yeah. i mean like clear or, or not no not clear it was kind of murky yeah people would use it for yeah the drinking you know, obviously use it for farming and then they would fucking use it for as a bathroom too so wow <laughs> better get upstream yeah i get up fucking stream away <laughs> from the village fucking christ um when you guys bagged ass out of there um I mean that that's a process with the shit that you had there, right? Did you have to airlift stuff out ahead of time? And yeah, then, a lot of airlifts. Um, came in to load load all the sensitive gear up, all the ammo. They're getting lit up while they're coming into. I mean, yeah, majority of the time they would. Um, even as you're leaving. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And then, so we ended up packing shop there, and then we lifted and shifted to this other site, which is in um kind of a main, more of a hub. Is, it was called a DLP, a district, um, DSP, district stability platform. Basically, it's like bigger than a VSO site, village stability platform or VSP. Um, basically, you're near kind of like the district and key leaders in like this little city. I can't remember what the city was, but it ended up being ran by Romanians. Romanians used to be wow. there. So we took it over because Romanians left. Yeah. And it was, it, was, it was a legit fob it was built up i mean we were living in like we were from living in alaskan tents to living in bee huts we had a chow hall we had you know it was we had a huge we had stuff we had a gym so it was different living towards like the last month and a half two months were the operations similar or were they different they were different we had we had like and we had mobility platforms we go out we barely went out that towards the end like the last month we didn't really do much um, we went out a few times. We inter- did some uh, vehicle interdiction coming off like this main highway right in front of our fob. A lot of dudes who would track um, their cell phones, hey, coming in, hey, you got the guy coming in right near you. And we would just interdict their vehicle right there and just stop them. Yeah. Uh, Any hairy shit that last couple months? We got like a couple ticks. Um, the dudes got close, um, but nothing too crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, overall, when uh, and nothing with the dog that was the dog still with you. I'm assuming at that point he was, but yeah, nothing significant with the dog yeah. that I can recall. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess your perspective and your platoon's perspective at, as you wrap that deployment up. Uh, what what was that like? The whole in general, yeah. I thought the whole experience was was phenomenal to me. I mean, that was the, the best deployment I've been on yeah. at that point. What, uh, what made it that for you? I think it was just the whole experience in general, the way we were living. One, it was really rugged, and uh, you know we're all freaking suffering there together. And being away from the flagpole, sort of sense where we could do what we want when we want. Um, the, the amount of combat we got into, the, the fighting we got into, which which was huge. Um, some may, people may think that's a bad thing, but it's we got to do our what we were trained to do in my opinion um that's that's every kind of team guy's dream is you, you bust your ass through training and then you want to go overseas and fucking put it to the test yeah and we really got to do that on the deployment so i'm very grateful for that and it's and just everything we got to do just all, every experience lessons learned you know losing some guys working with partner forces building relationships uh it was just it was a game changer for me yeah um sounds like not not all of your platoon mates felt that way 
Yeah, I would say not. I mean, they all enjoyed it because it was a great deployment. But I'd say towards the tail end, there were some people that were pretty pissed off just because of what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, were there any big accolades for you or any of your platoon members, uh, bronze star, silver star wise, on that deployment? Uh, nothing crazy. A couple guys got like NAMs with V's, uh, with Valor. Um, our chief got a BV, bronze star with Valor. Because uh, he's a chief. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like anything, yeah. it wasn't like a heroic moment or anything. Like, not that I remember, but some yeah. dudes got awards. There were some dudes that did some good shit on, on the battlefield that deserved uh, yeah. um, Valorous awards. Yeah. Maybe not a level of a bronze, but definitely like a NAM with V and something yeah. like that. Yeah, right on. Uh, all right, so you guys come back from uh, from that deployment. Did you know right away you are going to be going to Columbia uh, on the next one? No, because after I got back, that's when I became a buzz instructor. Oh, really? Yeah. So you did, you went back after being an instructor to, to, to do another deployment? Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about buds real quick. Uh, having been one myself, I, I know for me what, what it was like going through that. I'm curious, just kind of a, a brief synopsis on – what your thoughts of having been a student and then an instructor, what was that experience like? That was such an eye opening experience for me. I mean, I grew not you know, matured not only personally, but professionally a lot. Uh, Cause I had to um, being, a, I was a first phase instructor and I, I fucking loved every day of that job. Yeah. I mean, I knew right before I even went there, I wanted to be first phase. There was no other phase I wanted to go to. So I called, immediately called the operations, like, hey, I want first phase. Did you pick uh, going to the center or was it? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to go there. I wanted to be an instructor um, and to kind of learn that side and also kind of give back to the community. Um, I loved every day of it because just because what we were doing, um, the job in and of itself, um, first phase specifically because it's more of like the selection part of the training, um, being on the forefront there, seeing guys right when they start out, and then watching them pretty much just suffer throughout training. <laughs> I mean, I li- I really enjoyed it. I, plus, I'm like, every day, you know, I'm on the beach, I'm working out with these guys, yeah. you know, I'm outside. Like, you couldn't really ask for a much better gig. Yeah. Well, especially in the broader spectrum of, like, you're forging – America's next generation of, yeah. of most elite warriors. I mean, I, I know, and I'm, and I'm assuming it's the same for you. I mean, it's this way for every team guy is that I, I remember and will always remember and revere and respect the shit out of all of my buds instructors. I mean, mm-hmm. like those guys were just like fucking gods among amongst legends almost, you know, they were, they were just larger than life. All of them, you know, absolutely. And, uh, and, and played such a fucking impactful role on me and, and, and our generation of team guys and yours. And I mean, everybody, you know, and it's just like, that's such a, a big part of our community is the instructor cadre at buds, you know, like it, it, it really does, I think play the, the most influential role on, on the culture of our community without a doubt, you know, um, I a hundred percent agree. And being on the other side of the curtain, you know, your student, you're like questioning why the things are done yeah. the way they are. And then you, you know, you go out and implement it. Uh, and enforce this curriculum, which yeah. curriculum is proven. I don't care how they try to dilute it or whatever. The curriculum hasn't changed. Even when I was an instructor, that there's people coming and try to dilute it, yeah. people questioning it. And I think at the end of the day, the curriculum is what it is, and it's effective, and that's what weeds out the people that don't want to belong there and people who do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I'm with you. First phase was instructors were my most influential. Yeah. That's the ones I remember. Yeah. There's a couple second phase, but. Yeah. But was there a, uh, a biggest hammer instructor of yours that you remember? Um, Rideau was there when you were there, right? Rideau, Baldwin, uh, hey, Romero. Bal- yeah. Baldwin was a fucking hammer, huh? Yeah, Baldwin was always like a hammer. Yeah. yeah. He always. That's fine. I remember him specifically being just like ruthless all the time. Yeah. Like he would never, he was always just fucking just pissed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with what the guy's been through, it's crazy. What's interesting. I, I went, uh, I was on a deployment with his older brother, which, uh, I won't get into that here. I'll, I'll, that's a whole nother fucking story, but, uh, it's, it's amazing the difference between him and his brother mm-hmm. operation. I don't know if you know the story behind no. his brother or not, uh-huh. but, <laughs> um, well, fuck. I mean, I just his uh, his brother fucking hung it up on us on deployment, 
like uh, we we did we took down the GoPlat at the start of the Iraq War, and then okay. and then we we stole an Air Force Humvee that was green, hand painted it fucking tan the night before, loaded all of our shit up, and drove up into Nazaria across the border, and and just as we were about to load the the vehicles, his brother fucking quit, like said I can't can't go, I can't do it. Wow, yeah. So, and then his brother was the exact opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. Know? And I don't know if that's part of why he was that way, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, they, they were polar opposites that way, but fuck, I got to sneeze. Um, <clears throat> or not, but yeah, the, uh, I remember <clears throat> being an instructor with, with Baldwin for a couple of hell weeks, uh, being on the same shift. And yeah, I mean, that dude was, uh, he was intense, man. No doubt about it. He was uh, he was always walking the line of <laughs> oh yeah he was walking the line of like going too far and like <laughs> yeah, of, what, of what's even fucking maybe legal oh yeah <laughs> or not you know but when it was it when and then yeah. fast forward to when I'm an instructor oh man I could, it was just so easy to yeah. so easy to cross that line because you get so fucking pissed yeah well I, you know and I think uh, you know for those listening that maybe it's hard to uh, rationalize that or, or understand I mean it. I think that when when you go through, I don't think I know when you go through, and you've been to war with these guys, and you know what that is like, and now you see this fresh crop of dudes that want to do that also, and you know that these guys are going to be going to teams that that your buddies that you've been to war with or or what have you that you're tight with that you know your brothers with are there is that you know that's not a game you know it's not a competition it's not a game it's not a joke it's not. No anything to scoff at and so you know i think it's pretty pretty natural to take it very personally if people are, are not pulling their weight or they're trying to cheat or or just shit bagging something when you know what the the ramifications and negative impact that 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 is going to do if they go to a team with that mentality and so it it's very difficult to not just take it to a, a le- level 11 yeah uh, on everything you oh, know? always but, yeah, and I, there was like, and you get the whole gamut of instructors, and you know, as you know, you got the guy that's like a yeller, or fucking dude yeah. that's real calm, or just kind of the disappointed dad, or the fucking <laughs> the psycho who whispers. Yeah, the psycho guy who kind of he uses he just whispers in their ear and just convinces them that they're just not good enough, and they. Yeah. So I worked with some guys that were fucking good at that. Yeah. And they literally would just get in students' heads. Yeah. They're, they're, that did not belong there. Go on record, did not belong there. The students. The students, yeah. but. So they just got in their head and they just, I'm done. Yeah. They're well, effective. Uh, are any of them still on active duty? Can you mention any of who, the, who they were? Uh, most of them are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, most of them are on active duty still. How, how would you uh, classify yourself as an instructor? What what type were you? I was more of, I wasn't the yeller. Uh, I was more of kind of like the disappointed dad type. I would just like get in there. I would just like pull them aside and like single dudes out a lot and yeah. get in their face, but I wouldn't be like this outlandish um, instructor on yeah. out there. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, did you ever get voted as the hugger instructor? No, I did not. <laughs> yeah. We had a guy that uh, definitely did. He was like this huge, he was like six, two big. He's like a big teddy bear dude. Call him a big hugger. Funny shit. Because <laughs> he uh, let people, and it's cl- especially the class he was proctoring, yeah. he'd take it easy on. Yeah. <laughs> did uh, Did you ever kind of single handedly make anybody quit? Not necessarily intentionally, but just your. I'd say yeah. Like when I was a proctor of my class, um, basically every class, those who don't know, gets assigned an instructor who's their proctor. Basically, is like the me- conduit between the rest of the instructor staff. So. But it's it's actually an honor to be in a proctor because not every instructor gets to do it. It's not like a guarantee. Mainly the head shit will say, "Yeah, Kennedy, take this class or whatever." So I was I was pretty I was grateful that I got to do at least I did it once. Yeah. But being there, I was able. To, I knew the guys better than the rest of the staff because I would stay out late. I would show up early and get to know these people. But yeah, I would have some talks and people. They would quit like immediately. <laughs> They would. I, That's a trip, man. Because they would look at me like you know that whole the, you know, fucking instructor Kennedy doesn't like me, so yeah. I got to get the hell out so, of here. I mean, like I would just tell him straight up, like you're not meant to be here. You know, I'd just <laughs> I'd be heart to heart. Yeah, the tough talk. Yeah, yeah, that's a fucking trip. Uh, all right, so you spend uh, was it three years? Two there? years there, 2013, 2015, and then I got a spot. Hey, LPO spot at Team Four again. So I was like, yeah, I'll take that, definitely. So I went back to Team 4. 
And then I was LPO, leading petty officer in a platoon, and did a full workup there. Did you know you were going to Columbia during the workup? Yeah. yeah. I knew I was going to South America. Yeah. Because uh, just the troop I was in, I was in three troop. Their AO is South Com, South America. I just, I knew, but I didn't know exactly where I was going to go in South America at the yeah. time. But I am going to Colombia, and I'm going to Cartagena, Colombia. Oh, shit. Yeah. It's like some fucking uh, romancing the stone action. Yeah, that was a, it was a beautiful place, too. It was like a little mini Miami. Yeah. There is a lot of hot ass there, correct? Yeah, there's a lot of beautiful women there. Yeah. You can say hot ass. <laughs> like yeah, there's a lot of, there's, yeah, definitely. Um, the, uh, but the overall, um, I guess, culture there is is pretty corrupt right i mean oh yeah is that a big part of why you're there can you talk about kind of what the the big mish was for you guys to go there the big mish there was more of advise and assist yeah their partner force Um, how competent were were they or were they not barely i mean they're okay we we work with their quote-unquote sf unit and the funny thing is, like, the police force in those types of countries are corrupt as they come. Yeah. They don't, they don't really utilize their police force to kind of interd- do any type of interdiction or type of enforcement. They use their military, which is more vetted. The, the dudes are more trustworthy. Um, so we worked with their SF Special Forces Unit. They call it GRUCON. And we basically just trained them yeah. we, on everything from firearms, CQC, put them through, like, a little mini – I developed, like, a little mini selection for them. So they had some like credentials, um, which like a little mini workup yeah. type thing. And then we, they would do more uh, counter narcotics op- operations. That was kind of like their focus. Yeah, and we would just advise them on that. Does it seem like kind of a lost cause given the magnitude of of uh, the activity down there and how powerful the fucking cartels kind are? Kind of. It's kind of. They're just like scratching the surface. I mean, I mean, they're so outgunned and outmanned. Yeah. and outfunded. It's like. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Exactly. Like, they don't get treated well. They live are, like crap. I mean, are they, I guess I would ask like the black and white question, like, are they making a difference or not really? Probably not really. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucking wild, man. Um, they were just kind of going through the motions. Yeah. yeah. Was there, uh, were there any of their guys that uh, gave you the sense of like, yeah, these are solid, tough dudes, competent? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, not everybody, but um, just like in Afghanistan, there's like those handful of dudes that were fucking locked yeah. tight yeah and we're good to go and we like to work with those guys yeah i never really like to work with like their head shed their leadership because these officers these their head sheds like self-proclaimed officers like these people have no kind of credibility to to hold the position that they're in yeah. kind of like in the middle east like they're just kind of appointed and yeah they're really it's like you're the supreme yeah you're, you're nobody fucking, yeah. and also they're just difficult to deal with yeah, it's um, like Saddam's it. cousin who's never even been through boot camp yeah. and all of a sudden has nine rows of ribbons and is the general in charge. That's exactly <laughs> how it was. I'm like, yeah. it's just, it's it's brutal to deal with these people. Yeah. And well, you, yeah, I mean, you can't have somebody like that lead a group of people when they have no concept of, of what it's like to be them, yeah. you know? I mean, that's leadership 101. But um, did you guys do any competitions with them while you are there? Like, did you grapple? Did you play soccer? Did you fucking, you know, do any? Played any- soccer. Yeah. I talk with them like once a week. Oh, no it was shit. fun. Yeah. We got our ass kicked. I yeah. suck at soccer. Yeah. But it was fun. We, um, cause they played it all the fucking time, yeah. but that job was fun. Like most, of, it was a lot, it was a lot more play than work. Yeah. Just fucking there. around. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I, I, guys, I'll be honest. Did they take you guys out and fucking party it up? Uh, yeah, we would go out with them. Yeah. A few of them, not all of them. Yeah. Um, we would go out with them cause we live like, 20 minutes away from downtown oh and wow. like and they this uh El, old spanish town they call it el centro basically it's like a re- it's behind like this giant wall um i think like spain built way back when and there's like this really cool like city within it yeah and that's where all like the restaurants the bars the clubs the fucking people hang out so that whole deployment you guys were just staying in hotels in there no, we, we actually initially we were but then we got a house um really nice house actually so it was still just like civilian accommodations yep civilian accommodations of a nice house so you go from eating frozen shit food or or foot bread and fucking oh it's a complete 180 and 
it fucking, was living the fuck. It was living the high life. I mean, yeah. getting paid well because you still get per diem, per diem, all that high per diem living there, living a great place, nice home, five story house on the beach. Like the beach is twenty yards away, where we could see the sand. Yeah, and had a pool, had internet, <laughs> had fucking TVs, had. Dude, I mean, I, I already know the shit that went on in that fucking place for a six month deployment. <laughs> you guys fucking being there. And it was like, it was, we all got spread to the wind, our whole platoon. And it was only five of us in this house. Wow. Fucking crazy. Four team guys, I had me, myself. Yeah, four of the team guys and one support guy. Wow. Any GoPro footage from that? Yeah, but that's locked in the hard drive. That <laughs> it's meant to get burnt when yeah. I passed. T- TPI <laughs> hard drive. I, I was going to ask, too, on the Afghanistan stuff, did you get any, uh, any decent, like, GoPro footage or anything like that in any of your contacts? No. A couple of our, I would say maybe like a, a few that I didn't take, but a yeah. couple guys did. But yeah, I, I wish I'd done that more, but I didn't. Yeah, I, you know, I, I hear you. I, I have so so little fucking of, of anything from my time there. Granted, Even was, photos like it's I don't have that many. Yeah. Um, for I guess on that the uh, was there like a, a big faux pas of taking pictures and video of your stuff? Like were they hard on you guys about that? No. Not really. No, the fo- the photos, no, but I don't know much about the video. Yeah, because there wasn't too many of us yeah. that even had GoPros back then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They had this little side mount camera, like I think it was called like the Contour or something like that. Yeah. Dudes would just Velcro it to the side of their their bump helmet. But. Yeah. Um, all right, so anyway, back to Columbia. The uh, overall is a fucking great experience. Did you feel like you learned learned anything, got out of that deployment, or was it just kind of more of a good deal trip? The majority of it was a good deal trip, but I learned a lot with working with interagency folks. Yeah. Working out of that. We worked out of an embassy annex. The main embassy was out of Bogota. There was an annex out of Cartagena, which we worked with the State Department. Um, I used to go in there daily with my OIC, and then we worked alongside DEA, and we also did some stuff with the CIA liaison that was there what was your impression of both of those organizations competency wise professionalism etc to me they seem like fucking clowns and and the experience that i've had with either of them has not been positive it's been a long time also but the dudes that we the dea guys we interact with live there and they they live there for like past four or five years oh wow um it was hit and miss um we trained some of their guys but I don't. I felt like everything they did, they were doing some shady stuff. Yeah. I don't know. They just to me, it's <laughs> like I don't know what they were doing. They were the guys walking around like a bunch of drugs and whatever they're working with their partner force. Who knows what they were doing? But it just seemed like they were shady. Yeah. In my maybe they weren't. But have you seen the show Narcos? Yeah, yeah, like it's those like that. two guys. <laughs> like it was the, like that. Yeah, the fucking cheesy mustache. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, so and they they like embraced the whole culture there too, and it was like. Yeah, like a couple of wives and a couple of this. Couple of this. Yeah, <laughs> but the CIA guy, he was really cool. But that was that guy was interesting person. Yeah, is there a craziest story from living in that house on that deployment? We never had any. Uh, nothing crazy. We never did had any like house parties there. Yeah, that was a no go. But uh, that was like never. We didn't want to risk it. Um. But, but we did a lot of stuff out in town. Um, <laughs> we trained some. We actually made like a selection course there, right in front of our house. It was pretty funny. Like we would beat this fucking partner for us right in front of the beach, in front of people eating food. Around the t- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did the people that you were, that lived around you did they know who the fuck? It you was so were? so. It was so odd. Like it was our house, like this nice, brand new. It was legit, like four stories, and I had a fifth story rooftop deck. And so then you guys each had your own level. Everything, yeah, each own level. Every house around us was literally cinder block home, tin roof. It was poor. Yeah, and we were funny. like the 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 gringos. Yeah, don't money. stand out. Yeah, <laughs> I live on the corner. Bunch of white dudes in a fucking mansion. <laughs> they like they think like who? What are these? They they know we worked for the government, but they yeah. didn't really know what we did. But that seems fucking dangerous to me. Like. I mean, I'm assuming you weren't, like, were you carrying? Did we you? had, no, we weren't allowed to carry when we drove out in town, unless we were on, like, a, an op with this partner for us. Did you guys have we guns? Had, we had guns inside the house yeah. in case some shit went down. Yeah. But we weren't, like, 
we weren't allowed to like CCW or anything like that. Yeah, that seems fucking dicey to me, man. Like, oh yeah, tell totally. like, you, you fought car- that a lot. I mean, if I'm a cartel guy and I see this, like, why wouldn't I send a group of twenty mass dudes <laughs> to go fuck you guys up? You know, like they could easily just own our ass. Yeah, I mean, that's fuck. That's crazy. Um. All right. So you wrap up with that. You come home at this point. Uh, what was your decision to say? You know what? I'm done with the fucking navy and I want to get out. Yeah, it was when I was a, I went to trade it after that. Um, went to Salk, a training cell, special operations, urban combat training cell, and I became a chief. And I ended up just being the uh, LCPO of it, the chief petty officer of the tra- of that division. It was good. I learned a lot. Fucking definitely honed my craft when it comes to those type of operations because I instructed it. It's when you learn the most, I feel like. But towards the tail end of that, um, that's when I kind of decided I wanted to get out. I wanted something more for my life. Yeah. I didn't. Reason being is because I saw what was next for me after that, which was this pretty much the same thing. I mean, I could have went back to become a platoon chief, but it's still the same workup. Um, I just wanted to do more. I wanted the life. I love the teams, but I think it was more of the, the military lifestyle. I started to hate yeah. being gone all the time, um, putting that first all the time. Um, I at, just I just didn't like it anymore. At this point, were you dating your current? Nope. No, I didn't meet her until I moved back home. I got out. Uh, how was that transition? Uh, and did you have shit lined up police-wise uh, when you got out? or what? Uh, no, I didn't have anything lined up. Well, I was applying for the FBI, and then I went through that entire hiring process. They didn't pick me up. Really? Uh, You're probably too good of a guy, I think, for yeah. that. <laughs> To your two circle confident. back i thank god because i do they're so fucked fuck up. that yeah they are so that would not up. fit my personality i'm so happy that it didn't happen yeah. whatever it is what it is so learned a lot from that uh, i thought that was gonna be my easy transition because i applied to pretty much a year out before i even got out to do the, to hire yeah um that went through failed got out said i'll figure it out and having nothing planned, nothing fucking lined up. <laughs> so twelve year, twelve and change in, you get out, move back to California. You're back to 30. California, yeah, thirty two, thirty three, and then I was like, fuck. I was like, what am I gonna do? So I was trying to figure it out what I'm gonna do. I ended up getting a job with SpaceX. No shit. They're private security for like a month and a half. Yeah. Did you didn't ever, like it? Yeah. Did you ever interact with uh, Elon at all? I saw him. No, I didn't interact with him, but I. Walked, used to patrol near where he sat all the time and yeah. s- seen him work. But it was a cool experience, cool place to work. Didn't like the, the responsibilities. It was too boring for me. Yeah. Um, left that and then did like a couple contracting gigs for security with some other team guys. Um, started grad school. Did that for about a year. MBA. Didn't, I haven't finished it yet, but did that for like a year. Where, uh, where at? At Chapman University. It's in Orange County. And then one day I went to the range, shot with some friends, family friends. And then it kind of, and I was pretty much instructing them because they didn't know. I was just teaching them and kind of just the light bulb went off. And I was like, Fuck, I'm going to start a business. And I got way more motivated when that kind of fireball started, that motivation started coming in inside of me again. So I was like, I'd rather put my effort and energy into something of my own than another business or a corporation yeah. or whatever. So I just hit the ground running hard for like a year and a half of my company. And I just said, that's pretty much how I provided for myself. Just did two, just did private lessons. Yeah. Which, I mean, I think a lot of times people think California and nobody has guns. I mean, it's actually a pretty decent fucking business in California. Oh yeah. There's a big two way community in California for yeah. sure. A lot of people like guns. Yeah. Especially SoCal. Yeah. Uh, what kind of stuff were you teaching? Rifle, pistol mainly. Um, similar stuff that I, we were taught in, in basic, training. Uh, yeah, it's like basic. combat shooting type stuff. Mainly, the majority of it, honestly, was just more handgun and basics. Just basic, basic fundamentals. Yeah. When majority of the people I trained, no experience to limited. Yeah. The uh, any, any schools that you went through on active duty, other than, did you guys go to Shaw's? Yeah. Was there Shaw's. any other above and beyond that that you went to? No. Did a couple guys that came in, did some like CCW courses, like it came to Little Creek, but that was it. Yeah. 
Um, so you do that for a year and a half. At what point did you decide, uh, and just if you could shout out your, uh, your website for, uh, for that business. So my business name is Kennedy Defensive Solutions and the website's kennedydefensivesolutions.com. And, uh, d- do you still run courses? Can you still run courses or do yeah. privates or I haven't taught a lesson in probably about six months and also have like the other side of the business is online. So I do like a bunch of, I have like a bunch of online, um, web courses for firearms. Oh, sweet. Uh, is there any conflict of interest issues with, uh, police doing that? Uh, no, if I were to train like my own department, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe. And I wasn't technically allowed to like work when I was going through initial training for become a police officer. Yeah. I still kept the business running. I just stopped in person services pretty much. Oh, okay. Um, what what made you decide uh, to to go be a law enforcement officer? Uh, I think all the stars aligned. I've always it's always kind of been in the back of my mind. I've always been interested in, in law enforcement. I thought it'd be a good path um, for me. I thought I'd be pretty good at it. Uh, but as I started training people, I met more and more cops in my area, and it kind of just sparked my interest. And and I was like, I felt like I that I felt like I knew I wanted it and needed to do it. Um, and every person I asked kind of directed me towards the department I'm at now. And at the time I joined, like at the height of COVID last year. Uh, so it was a bad time for police. Um, but it all worked out cause the place I'm at now is, is incredible yeah. in my, my opinion. I mean, I'm all, I'm biased. I only know one department, but I know in my area it's, it's, it's as good as they come. Yeah. That's good to hear. Um, what was the experience like going through the academy as a guy in your thirties with multiple fucking combat deployments being a SEAL? Like that was, that was the toughest thing probably mentally for me. I mean, physically and everything else, it wasn't that challenging. It was pretty fairly easy to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't go there for the physical challenge, but I learned to become a cop, which was challenging to, to think like a cop, uh, and also, it's more like you're getting flashback to like Navy boot camp. You're literally marching around everywhere. Everything you say, everything you do is scripted. Yeah. It you and you're yelling at the top of your lungs, which is hard for me. And when I went in there, they already knew who I was. They already knew my background, so they immediately thought I was going to be some arrogant dickhead. <laughs> so they try to test me all the time. In the beginning, at least, they eventually found out like, hey, I'm I'm here to play the game. Yeah. I'm not here to fucking think I'm cool and better than all of you. So they laid off me. Um, but it was a fun, it was a fun experience. Is it six months? Yeah, six months long. So it's a pretty good amount of time. And the hardest thing I found for me was just shifting my mindset to think like a cop, to be more analytical, more than not. Yeah. Not the sense that seals aren't analytical, but just seals are more like offensive kind of mindset. Maybe a little less reactive. Yeah, less reactive <laughs> or more like, hey, let's just handle the problem right now. Yeah. And being a police officer, it's more of talking to people, mm-hmm. uh, the nice gift of gab, and solving problem solving. And yeah, you're you're reactive. You got to react on people's reactions, mannerisms, what they say, what they're doing, and how to decipher. All at the same time, you're kind of deciphering the, the laws and the crimes that this person may have done or violated and yeah. you're kind of use it to your advantage uh to see what you got but that was the hardest thing for me yeah I, I am curious i mean from a a mentality shift standpoint going from being in combat scenarios to where now you're on the streets of america which is clearly very different how do you uh, kind of interpret it that way or, or how do you go about the day-to-day to to stay focused uh, that way as opposed to defaulting to that that mormon uh, uh military mindset yeah i try to i mean it, a lot of it carries over to my to my advantage i think you know just being like on, on alert and there's a lot of transferable stuff there which i use to my advantage when i'm on the streets uh not the but on the flip side of that not every person i react or come in contact with is a bad person yeah. and i, I got to remember that um so I, it's, in this job, I feel like it's really easy to get jaded and calloused yep. um, with, with dealing with people. Uh, 
and the city I work with, the majority <clears throat> of the people I deal with are not good people. Yeah. Uh, at least I in- come across with. Majority of the people that live there are great people in the city. I mean, they're ninety-five percent of the people are just hardworking people, just like any other city. But it's a five, you know, that five percent are just causing problems. And that's who you're dealing. That's with. That's who you're dealing with. And it really op- being a cop in the ci- in the inner city where I work really opened my eyes to the things that go on, you know, under everyone's noses that goes about their business, the everyday life. You know, it's can we get a couple of examples? Yeah, <laughs> the the violence in my city, gang violence runs rampant. Shootings run rampant. They have over you know hundred over hundred homicides a year in my city. Guns are running rampant. Sex crimes running rampant. Uh, child sex crimes running rampant, and homeless transient crime is running rampant. I mean, it's just drugs. I'm assuming drugs through the roof. And nowadays, drugs is nothing. I mean, drugs is nothing. It's weird. To, I use it to my advantage to like detain and hold people, but. It, in the, the day, we really don't charge people because it's just a ticket, <clears throat> just because the way they're diluting the laws with drugs. Um, Do you think that that uh, is a problem? Oh yeah, that's a huge problem. I, I mean, I guess we, a, we would be able to have a, the ability to take a lot more shitheads off the street if we if that was a as bad as it was, kind of you know five, yeah, ten years ago. But I mean, I guess. Do you think from a big picture liberty standpoint, do you think drugs should be illegal? No, I wouldn't say all drugs should be illegal. I, I don't agree with that, but um, maybe some of the real hard ones, like all the meth and yeah. you know, the heroin and stuff like that. That what I see, it's it's basically like a conduit of more crime. I mean, yes. but a lot of the times that people I interact with are it's homeless too. Homeless is a big problem, and that's where a lot of the crime stems from. Yeah, is you, all these people are homeless nothing to lose and is it mostly like robbery or is it yeah petty theft robberies um which is big in my city and then the gang violence there's a lot of gangs in my city do you know uh are there a lot of gangs or a lot of gang members like is there just a couple a lot of different gangs so in my city it's weird it's i don't know over a, a dozen gangs are they the the usual suspects or are they some weird offshoots Usual suspects. So I live. In, I work in a city. It's mainly Hispanic. Yeah. So it's all Hispanic gangs, um, and there's some Vietnamese, but they, they just run rampant in the city. Is that the uh, the north south groups, or is there more to it than that? More to it than that. Yeah. A lot of these stem from like a couple. A lot of the the gangsters that I come across with nowadays are like young. Yeah. Fifteen, sixteen, maybe twenty, twenty one, twenty two. I mean, a lot of these guys are committing these heinous crimes, like murdering people or doing whatever, when they're juveniles. Yeah. And they can't be charged. Then they barely do get punished because juvenile court is more about rehabilitation than convicting, you know, Punishing. putting away people for life. Yeah. So, and these criminals know that and they utilize these kids to, to carry out these crimes and they go away for a year or two and come right back out and do it again. Yeah. Um, I really came across too many, like, OGs like old time gangsters like you think of when like when they started out in like Los Angeles and um, the Crips and the Bloods that, that is a whole new era just was, just a whole new generation of, of yeah. people so they're like sp- lots of small gangs internet gangsters kind of all you know? vying yeah. for <laughs> for territory in, in the area yeah it's all about territory yeah. all about neighborhoods um, just fucking their goal is just to hey I'm gonna go plaque up or tag their cross them out in their neighborhood they're gonna do it the same and next thing you know they fucking fight or they shoot each other yeah <clears throat> to me it seems like <clears throat> that's a result of two two main things which is um being poor and too much fucking free time on your yep. hands you know um and lack of structure in their life p- yeah. in general like family and everything yeah yeah i just uh you know there's so many places i mean you think about places we've been where they're even poor but they're so poor to the point where like they don't have time to fuck with stuff like that because they're just trying to survive you know it's like this weird kind of worst of both worlds area that we have here that that people are as a country collectively we're wealthy enough to where nobody is really poor the way they're poor in in other countries um you know so there's that 
but then there's, you know, it, it's not bad enough to where like they have that amount of free time to fuck off. I mean, I talk a lot about this in, uh, in that book that's coming out here in a few days um, about, you know, the, the prison system being so fucking terrible for just, you know, regurgitating people and, oh, and, it's and, horrible. and not, not really serving the purpose um, of actually rehabilitating people. However you want to look at it. I mean, to me it's rehabilitating. If something is, is shitty enough to, to stave the behavior, that's rehabilitating somebody. In, in my opinion, uh, I use it all the time, um, you know, but I just don't understand the mentality of, uh, of, you know, cable TV and fucking college programs and, and, you know, a warm place to sleep at night. I mean, I, one of the things I mentioned in the book is, uh, from a punishment standpoint, you know, how, how cold affects people. Yeah. You know, so imagine a, a cell that, it's just big enough to lay down in. There's a hole in the ground the same way there is in the Middle East and a sink, and you get no clothes, right? And the ambient temperature in that facility is, is just warm enough to keep you from being hypothermic. Yeah. <laughs> Two weeks of that, and I, I guarantee you. You're going to change. People aren't going to go, aren't going to, they'll do whatever they have to to stay the fuck out of that environment, right? And that's, I mean, you can do that in a few days. You know, I mean, Hell Week is five and a half fucking days long. You know, you add water into it, and now, now there's, you know, a portion of the country that's going to consider that cruel and unusual punishment, which is by the letter of the law illegal, which, you know, even that is subjective because what's cruel and unusual is in the eye of whoever is Interpreting it's being it, yeah. ton, done to. But I just think, you know, it, it's pretty clear that prison systems are, are more of big business than they are anything else. Uh, you know, there's more, more people in prison nationwide than there ever has been and, and more than in most other countries combined. Uh, and it just doesn't work, you know, uh, and it just uh, turns a, a hamster wheel of criminal activity that uh, that just continues to fucking pollute our society. But and it's so hard to put people in jail nowadays, too. Like even yeah. for me, like it's or you could take them to jail and they're they're out before yeah. I'm even done writing the report. Yeah. That's two pages long. It takes me an hour and a yeah. half to write. So it's like it's like the Border Patrol guys like they're yeah. fucking <laughs> they're catching the same guy twice in one shift. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, just a short amount of time I've been there. I mean, I've dealt with interacted rest of the same person you know yeah. multiple people so what, it's, uh, it's ridiculous yeah what is the most common arrest that you're you're coming across probably domestic violence really um is it always to a point where like when you show up somebody's had the fuck beat out of them or is it kind of a wide range so it either falls between we call it like a dvr domestic violence report which is basically just a verbal argument between your spouse or significant other or you actually have a domestic violence crime which is like when you put hands on each other by a woman or male it doesn't matter but i would say it's a, about a split um but those happen every night multiple every yeah. night i'm probably giving like a good hook once a once a week twice a week maybe arresting someone for it yeah because it's in california it's you shall arrest it's not like i can't use my discretion at that point as soon as someone you know uh, someone says yeah, he punched me, or you know, the person has marks on them. It's a done deal. I have, I can't, I can't be like, okay, no, I'm not going to do it. So, in, in in an environment, let's say you there's a there's a call and you show up and there's no marks, but a woman says he punched me and he says no, I didn't. You have to arrest him. Yes, that's fucked up. I know. I mean, because yeah, it's that's the letter of the law for California. You shall arrest. Me as a police officer, I need to identify who's the dominant aggressor. Yeah. So I, there's plenty of times where the chick's done that, and we arrested the chick because she's full of shit. Yeah. Or she's being suspicious and acting, making shit up. You ever arrested a woman for whipping a guy's ass? No, not yet. Not yet. But men and women are the same, I thought. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I arrested the same thing. I arrested the guy last week for this, and it was. She said he pushed me push my shoulder in the back of my mind you know it's my job and i'll i'll handle it but it's like at the same time you can always have that innate feeling you're like come on yeah you know like but it is what it is i mean it, the thing is, it's more of a liability thing than anything in my opinion because yeah. if we leave it, it all stemmed from the oj simpson shit yeah if we leave he ends up killing her and then it's like well, what you were just here why don't you do something yeah and it's on me yeah. so 
nowadays like liability is huge with police officers and everyone's so like you're know, walking on eggshells you can't yeah do you worry about uh or, or i guess do you do you come across instances where um in a situation like that the guy is like i'm not fucking coming with you i didn't hit her fucking if you want to arrest me fucking try it like do you ever run into that yeah because to me that like that that's where where i i would even argue with police leadership from a liability standpoint is that most and grand this is completely anecdotal i'm going off of what it seems like so keep that in mind but it seems like most of the time or a lot of the times when you hear you know officer so-and-so was shot and killed on duty today responding to a domestic disturbance call like that happens a lot oh all the time you know and, and so to me it's one of those things like if you're asking our collective police force to go enforce these things that are inherently fucking dangerous and shit like that happens when, you know, there's plenty of dudes out there that from a principal standpoint, they're like, you're not fucking arresting me for some shit that I didn't do. Yeah. You know? And, and then now that like, if they're, they're willing to fucking fight you over it and then it's who knows what the fuck's going to happen, you know? And, and so from that standpoint, like to me, it doesn't really make sense. The, the liability justification on the, on the head shed part. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, I've came across some people that it's never been like a significant stand down. Yeah. Like, but some people that d did put up, you know, a little bit of fight. But in our city, it's a two man call always. A lot of the times you, s you see these videos where cops get shot, um, they're going to like by themselves to these domestic violence calls. Yeah. And they're yeah. Sh walking inside into their house by themselves or both in the room. And it's just like horrible. Um, we have different TTPs for how we handle business. Um, it's always a two man, always. And nine times out of 10, we'll try We separate them immediately. We'll have them come out of the house. Like, Hey, step outside. We'll talk to one of them and then leave like the husband inside or whatever. And then we'll deal with him later. Yeah. Um, but as soon as they, I feel like we show like a good show of force. Well, that people usually back down, but yeah. I guess if, from a hypothetical standpoint, right? Let's uh, let's do it like a training scenario. Uh, you don't know me from anybody. You, you show up to the house, and there's two of you. Um, you know, and, and woman says he whatever he got physical with me. There's no marks on her, and I say no, I didn't. You say okay, well we have to arrest you, and and, and me again. You don't know me from anybody. I say, well here's the deal. Like I'm not coming out of my house. I didn't put a fucking hand on her. And you're not fucking arresting me. You come in here, there's going to be a fucking problem. Yeah. Like, what do you do at that point? So if we weren't already in the house, I mean, if we're just outside the door or something like that, and you're right there, like, holding us back or right there at the doorway, we'd probably go hands-on with my partner, yeah. most likely. Um, and if it came in, then if it were like a no-shit fight fight, then it would probably turn into some emergency situation where we had to call other people to come. But yeah. more often than not, it'd probably lead, hey, kind of ask me, you know, tell me, you know, ask you, and I tell you, then I make you yeah. type of kind of progress uh, progression there. Yeah. But we definitely probably would go hands-on, probably make the situation worse. People, someone would probably get hurt. Yeah. And then it'd be this whole big deal. But I, I agree with you where you're at for sure. Um, I mean, that's not an easy scenario no. for anybody. You know, I mean, like, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be critical of, of police here because that, that's just a tough spot to be in. But I also know, you know, there's plenty of guys like us that are, are principled enough to where they're like, no. You oh, know, yeah. You're not coming into my fucking house and arresting me for some shit that I didn't do, you know? Yeah. Um, and that, that's just a tough spot to be in. But well, that watching the knot, we, how I've kind of tailored my tactic is we immediately separate where they can't even see each other different room, whatever, outside, one's inside. And for ever, what a point she says, yeah, he like pushed me, he punched me, strangled me, whatever. I get that word. Then I kind of still talk to you in a sense where like nothing's happening. And then I'll be like, sir, hey, before I leave, hey, I just want to search you real quick, make sure everything's good to go. You know, everything seems all right here. Put them in a position of disadvantage. And then I grab them, boom immediately put cuffs on you without telling you you're under arrest yet. Yeah. So I kind of talk him in, I sneak, you know, tactically, I surprise him with it. And as soon as I have hooks on you, I own you. Yeah. 
God, so, that shit would piss me off. Yeah. So <laughs> I did that last night. I did that like the other night Christ. with a guy. Yeah. I'd, I was I'd like, hey, stand right up real that. quick. You know, just turn around with search you before I leave. And yeah, they're, like, like, they're usually like, okay, like, hey, no problem. You're out of here. Cool. I'd be like, how about I take all my yeah. clothes off instead? <laughs> then you don't have to worry about it. But most people don't think like us. <laughs> most people don't. They don't. They don't. <laughs> I'll just get naked. Fair. If someone, a cop asked me, be like, okay, you're going to search me again after you just searched me? Because I, I already searched him once. Yeah. Yeah. So I need you to bend over and cough. There's some there's some ways to to slap cuffs on people without them knowing yeah. or talk them into it. Yeah. That's usually the best bet. Yeah. Fucking Christ, man. Yeah, you know, like I said, it's just hypothetical. That's a tough spot to be in. But um fr- from being a cop, you know, not not that long and at kind of the height of when it's at least to me, it seems like not a very good time to be a police officer. Have you run into a lot of the defund the police BLM riot? Fuck the police. You know, have you run into a lot of that? Yeah, I worked a riot already, and it was all like, it, the riot wasn't based off like the BLM or anything like that, but it had that same sentiment and still having protests in our city. Been to numerous calls where, you know, people walking out, hey, fuck the police, you're racist, like calling me racist to my face, like calling my partners racist. And you know, that sentiment is still there for sure. Um, I wouldn't say it's everybody though. I think it's starting to dwindle away, uh, as far as like everyone hating on the police, but as far as the stigma of police being under the radar, that's definitely still there. Yeah. That's not, I don't think that's going to go away. I think yeah. It's well, I mean, to be fair, I think, I think there's a level of that that should be there. Um, the, the irony I think with, we'll say the, the BLM group specifically, because this is the primary grievance is a singling of out or an assumption of because you're black that yeah. you're going to do X. The irony is that that same group is assuming that, well, because you're a cop, you're probably racist and want to shoot me because I'm black. You know, it's like on, on both sides, you know, like if you're if stereotyping, you, both yeah, sides. If, you, if you don't want people to stereotype you, it's probably a good idea not to stereotype them again on, on both accounts. But um, what, what is your, uh, well, actually, before I get into to this question, another thing in the book that I wanted to bring up is this, the statistics of that is that 2020 being the, the most recent year, you know, there was essentially nine instances of, of police officers shooting and killing unarmed black people. Uh, and, and in half of the cases, they either just had a weapon and, and had assaulted them and then dropped it. And, and technically it wasn't in their hands uh, or, or a similar fashion where it was saying that they were completely unarmed is a little disingenuous, but either way, percentage wise, you're talking frac- a fraction of a fraction, yeah. fraction of, of a percentage. Um, how do you view that in terms of like what the solution is to try to make some sort of headway, having been a civilian, um, you know, for a long time before you were a cop and, and being fairly well-traveled and, and seeing law enforcement and government, you know, across the, across the globe, let's say you're, you're the president or you're the chief of police or whatever is that, you know, somebody saying, Hey, you tell us how, how we fix this problem and get back to some semblance of normal. It's never going to be, you know, total fucking roses between civilians and cops by the nature of, of criminals in the job. But do you see a, a, a fix, a solution to, to any of it? I think it's being more involved with the community that you're working in. Just, they call it community policing, which, I think it just being in and around the community and showing the positive effects that police have in the community mm-hmm. and bring that to light more because yeah. everyone talks about all the shit that happens. None of the good stuff that police do every single day, you know, they're embedded in their community. They help kids in need, families in need, you know, they're protecting you, you know, they're, they're dealing with people while you're you know, sleeping in a nice cozy bed, you know, yeah. and preventing people from robbing you from, it just there's a lot of things that goes unsaid that should become brought to light, yeah. and that has to, that, that could be done with more, you know, like the community policing mindset. And I've learned that from my department because that's one of the kind of the pinnacles of the mission mission there. But if people become more aware and see the more positive things police do, then I feel like it's going to change the sentiment because, and the media is a horrible. Yeah. part of it too because that all they all they do is glamorize the the horrific events yeah and the and media only shows up even in my city they only show up when 
there's dead bodies on the road or there's been a shooting and that's all they care about. Yeah. Well, and there, there's a, a very skewed victimization of people that, that probably don't deserve that, that title either. Some of them do, mm-hmm. but most of them don't, you know, um, most of them are pretty fucking tough customers that, you know, have a, a lifetime of, of poor decisions that have got them to where they're at. Um, but, um, what, what is something that, you know, speaking to the public, like what's something that, that you think the public could do or needs to know or, or would be helpful for your average citizen to, to help also? When it comes to dealing with police, mm-hmm. I'd say have this type of mindset, you know, you don't have to respect the man, but maybe respect the position. And I learned that that's, I, I learned that from the, the military, you know, kind of you respect the position that he's in you know, go in, understand he's there. Police are there for a reason. They have a job to do. Um, and if, if they have that mindset, I think things would go a lot smoother on interacting with police. Cause I feel like people don't know how to interact with the cops. Mm-hmm. You know, they, as soon as they see one, I've noticed this. So it's immediately negative. Yeah. It's immediately, this guy is out to get me. Something's wrong. And not, you know, more often than not, they messed up. I mean, they've, I'm there for a reason. I'm, to, you know, but as a cop, I use my discretion a lot. You know, I don't let people go scot free for heinous crimes, but I use my discretion a lot, and I, I try to be understanding. And most co- and majority of cops are understanding. Is, is there so, a portion of your academy training that uh, goes into that the use of discretion? And yeah, and, the, yeah, there is like a few classes, yeah. and that's one of the greatest things I think a cop has. Yeah. I agree. I mean, to me, that's that's the biggest tool I think cops have in not making things worse at a minimum, you know, mm-hmm. and, and potentially making them better. And I, I we'll talk about it on the car show as it relates to stuff like that. But but just briefly is that I see that around here. You know, you've got hardworking, good, honest, tax paying citizens, you know, that live in, in good, nice suburban developments that aren't doing shady shit, um, you know, but didn't come to a complete stop and they're fucking pulled over getting a $300 yeah. ticket for it. And it's like, for me, I, I look at that and it's, it's like, you know, if, if I was you, that'd be one of those, like, I'm not going to worry about that, you know, type of thing. Um, because it, it's that shit that builds resentment in the yep. people that, that do support you. Like there's a group of people, granted they're small, but there's, there's a portion of the population that fuck, it doesn't matter what you do. They're going to hate you. Yep. You know, because all they do is illegal shit for a living. And so you, you by default are the enemy. But, you know, there's a, a large swath of the population, you know, that is generally very supportive and, you know, donates money to, to police foundations and, and you know, respects the, uh, the position, the officer, the badge, et cetera. Um, you know, but when they're, they're getting pulled over for dumb shit and yep. getting tickets for little stupid fucking things, um, you know, that, that, wears that out kind of quick you know? I, I agree it absolutely yep. does and that's not yeah me personally as a cop my goal is i'm that's not my business i mean i'm i'm not that's not my goal yeah i mean i'm not there to jam you know the hardworking people up for petty stuff yeah. those mi- minor traffic violations are there divisions within the department that that's their focus absolutely yeah and they will ticket you and cite you for the smallest of things yeah um that's just the way it is and that's because that, that, it's all about numbers, about stats, about... To me, it's like the yeah. same problem that the Department yeah. of Education has uh, instilled on, on our education system is that it's teaching to a test. Like, like if that is your goal, you're, you're inherently creating fucking problems in your community. I yeah. don't understand how Headshed doesn't see that. Yeah, and, and a, lot of, a lot of departments nowadays are more moving towards just being absolutely just reactive at all. That's it. They literally just hang out until a call comes in, they'll show up, handle it and leave. And what it's, what's going away, which is not going away in our department is being more a proactive police. And they call it, you're basically out there actively engaging, looking for criminals yeah. in bad neighborhoods and areas of high crime. Um, which we do a lot in my department, like majority of the night. That's what I'm doing. I'm not pulling people over ever unless they <laughs> i know there is some like criminals which catches your eye in vehicles i'll pull them over yeah um and coming out of bad neighborhoods so what, what are the flashing lights of that's a fucking bad dude so typically it's shaved head i got packed out with like cars <laughs> tattoos on the face i'm criminal profiling you know the 
late at night coming out of a bad neighborhood, um, doing something, you know, hauling ass out of a neighborhood. Usually you get like a quick glimpse. Like you see like shaved head, some tats on the face, or you see like a, like a big flat brim hat. Um, and they're usually kind of loaded out with like, not just one person. It's usually like they have three or four heads in the car. Yeah. Um, usually will catch your eye and they usually drive like jackasses. Yeah. Late at night, it stands out. Or some dumb, or they'll may not have their headlights on or something like that. Cause there's just like these little tiny little fuck ups they do yeah. that stand out at two or three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah, that's a bad dude. Or they're up to no good. Or they may have like fucking guns or dope in the car. Yeah. That's interesting. The, uh, I'm sure some people listen to that and say, oh, it's fucking stereotyping or profiling or what. But, you know, to me, I mean, it's, it's the same shit overseas. Like, you can tell by the way a guy's looking at you yeah. if, if he wants to fucking kill you or not, you know. Um, and and it's, it's usually pretty fucking simple. I don't know why that gets such a bad name of saying, okay, well, this, it's human nature to identify. Uh, well, it gets convoluted when people call it racial profiling yeah. versus criminal profiling. But if when you interact with these people daily. Yeah. You know what they look like. You know what criminals look like. They have a, a certain demeanor. They dress a certain way. They affiliate with the same people. I mean, yeah. it, it sticks out yeah. for sure. So, Do you have any desire to get on any spe- special unit? I mean, like I'm assuming SWAT would be one that you'd naturally yeah, that's, gravitate towards. I'm a maybe on that. Um, we have a part-time SWAT team. Oh. Part of me wants to do something new. I lived that kind of life Yeah. my prior career, so... I like want to dabble in some, narcotics or something. Yeah, or? I might, they have like a good vice unit. Um, they have like a good uh, career criminal unit, which they work in high level, like cartel, you know, people. Yeah. High level stuff. Um, usually they're dual sworn federally and locally. Oh, that's cool. So you work with other agencies on task force and stuff like that. So yeah, things cool. like that interest me. I'm just a patrol cop right now, which to me, I like the patrol because it's fun. Yeah. And that's when you learn the most. Yeah. When you're out in the streets every night, I like being on the street every night, driving around, fucking boot, basically your boots on the ground. You're the first one there. You're the first one to react to things. And then the investigators show up after the fact, after you've already dealt with the problem. Yeah. You know? Have you gotten in any legit fucking fights? Uh, I got in one use of force, and that's it thus, thus far. No, like, legitimate yeah. Going to blows or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, you train a fair bit, right? Grappling and fucking Muay Thai. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And then a lot of ve- handful of vehicle pursuits, chasing cars. Slow ones. Though. Uh, yeah, slow ones. <laughs> 20, 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've gotten to see a lot of things like shootings, stabbings, you know, there's everything. There's always something going on to see every single night. Is there a craziest thing you've seen thus far that sticks out? No, that's some stabbings and shootings, probably. Yeah. Uh, but some like horrific vehicle accidents. Yeah, there's a lot of vehicle versus pedestrians in our city. Oh, really? Cars just running people over left and right because a lot of homeless, so they just run across the street and oh. they just get tagged, and you know their body's like hundred yards down the road. You know? Fuck, man, that's brutal. Yeah, all, it happens more often than people think. Yeah, wow. Because they're they're wearing they're drunk they're. Hi, they're under the influence and they're running across the street. You can't see them. I mean, I can barely see them. You know, it just that's one of my biggest fears. I'm hauling ass down the city streets, two, three o'clock in the morning, no traffic. And next thing you know, you see this person with black overcoat, like in your headlights and it's yeah. done. Yeah. You can't see him from a distance. Yeah. Yeah, that's rough. Well, hot damn. So what, uh, what's next for you then? Just keep doing what you're doing and, uh, or what, like, what's your goal? Yep. Still grow as a cop. Um, become better at that. Learn as learn as I go, and then still do, going strong in my business. I still want to hammer that. Um, right now, I'm focusing more on the online side, which I really like. I like online business. Yeah. Um, I find it very interesting, and um, it's fun to yeah. make courses and stuff like that. I find it in- fun, so I want to hammer that. Um, as well as a, being a police officer. Being a police officer does it's taxing. Yeah. Uh, for sure it takes even though i work three days a week um some and then once once a month i work four days but those other days that sometimes you just like to have those days off and chill but i'm always like a, a goal setter i always like to try new things and go off and set new goals for myself otherwise i just get bored yeah and i just get stagnant um so i, I like always like to just like go after the next kind of 
sure. goal for me. Is being a cop something you see yourself doing 20, 30 years? Or? I don't know. Yeah. Being the age I am at, probably not. Yeah. You know, I, maybe 10. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, do you have like a lifelong goal? Is it to be an entrepreneur? and? Yeah, entrepreneur. Uh, I like owning my own business. Is, is, I get a lot of fulfillment from that. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's no way I could uh, work for anybody else at this point, having done my own thing for 12 years now. I mean, I just, uh, yeah, there's no, no fucking way I could work for somebody else, but I'd probably live out of my truck before I'd work for somebody else. Yeah. It, it, I, and I don't want to become, I don't want to do this job for 30 years and not to say there's anything wrong with it, but me personally, I just don't, I don't know if I'll mentally, I could uh, kind of take it. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, like I told you earlier, it's really easy to become negative and calloused yeah. with people. And if people think like, oh, how is that possible? But the people that you interact with, yeah. you just become disgusted with sure. actions of people, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that's where a lot of the uh, um, officer-involved issues come from. I mean, it's, it's rare that it's like, oh, this dude's been on the force four months and he's you know, it's a guy that's been around, you know, for years. 15, that, 20, yeah. In a shitty environment, that, you know, that just deals with the scum of the earth, trying to kill him all day, every day. And, yeah, I mean, that's that's naturally and inherently going to skew your perspective of the population, you know, if that's all you deal with. Mm -hmm. you know, that's I think it's pretty obvious. But uh, I think it's also one of those things that, unfortunately, that's just part of, of that gig. I wonder if maybe, like, better rotations where they're moving guys in and out of, of certain spots maybe a little more frequently instead of letting a dude spend, you know, four years straight working nights in a fucking shitty inner city you know, yeah. spot. I don't know, but does that make seem like it would make sense? Or? Yeah, so, and just trying out maybe go to investigations or a different, like, division or something like that where you're, you have a normal, kind of a normal schedule, you're doing more investigations, yeah. you know, you're not interacting with the public 24-7. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's that's people's image of cops is the p patrol officer. Yeah, they don't think of like detectives or anything like yeah. that. They, you know, that's what we're like this under the microscope, the patrol officer. So they think about uh, Tackleberry from Police Academy with the fucking with the radar gun, fucking everybody over. Yeah, yeah. I've used one of those. I only used it once on training. I'll never use it again. <laughs> the radar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the laser. Yeah, the lidar. Yeah. Use yeah. lidar. Oh, we're going to get all into that, into the yeah. car show. If you want to check them out on the car show, it's Uninfluenced. It's the other show that I do where we uh, shoot the shit, uh, tell dirty jokes, and talk about cars and bikes and politics and you name it. So check that shit out. But, uh, well, Travis, I appreciate the hell out of you coming. It's been uh, awesome hearing your story. I appreciate you sharing it with us, uh, and especially the perspective on transitioning over into being a, a police officer and what that's like. And, and uh, you know, it's just such a big, uh, big part of of our society uh, lately in the last few years of, of uh, kind of things that have gone gone on and transpired and, and some of the divisiveness that uh, that has stemmed from policing in, in this country. So I think it's good to to hear, uh, you know, cop side of the story and, and uh, get get your guys' perspective on it. So I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again, Mike. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, where, where can people get a hold of you uh, to do the online training and uh, just if they want to do any courses or anything like so that? So two places, my website, KennedyDefensiveSolutions.com, and then you can find me on social media at TravisKennedy267. So those are the two places where. Okay. Well, there you have it. If you want to get some, uh, some shooting instruction, uh, go check that shit out. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, just from, uh, from my standpoint, as always, I appreciate the uh, – the viewer, the listener, the supporter, uh, constantly uh, and routinely uh, tuning in episode after episode because if not for you guys, we wouldn't have a show. So thank you for your support. Uh, my book, uh, which you can see in, in Travis, can you hand me that? Uh, my book, Unfuck America, uh, comes out uh, probably about when this drops. So uh, go check this out. It's all things politics and uh my, my thoughts after running this show for the last three and a half years of interviewing a lot of amazing individuals uh, like Travis and uh, getting different people's takes on uh, what the issues are and how to solve them. So check that out. It's available on Amazon or MikeRitlandCo.com. And uh, until next time, this is Mike Drop.